Sorry to be a wee bit late for uh, everyone that's turned up to join late live tonight. Hey, I was chatting in the background to my guest tonight, just getting settled in and things. Only a minute or so late. It's wonderful to have you here. Listen, what the industry drinks is a decent, interesting, I think, platform in order to invite people forward from the industry behind the bar at the V Pub, in order for them to sure share what they drink and what they what their wee self indulgences and things like that are. But I think more than anything, what it unlocks is hopefully um, that ability to share the fact that so many people in the industry behind those tables at the hosted events and uh, uh, festivals, at the hosted uh, tastings that you might go along and join, so many of those people are super impassioned whiskey geeks and enthusiasts themselves. So these wee sessions, and I know there hasn't been enough of them yet, but we'll get there. These wee sessions are there to celebrate those folk. I'm looking forward to hanging out with my guest tonight, and I'll see you all in a second. <laughs> Hello, whiskey folk. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the VPUB. Welcome to another Thursday evening. I hope you're all doing very well. I hope you're pulling up a bar stool, getting comfortable. I hope you've got something nice and suitably wintry. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere, of course, <laughs> in your glass. And uh, yes, I hope you're enjoying what is obviously at the start of December already. First VPUB of December too. So you'll see that I've made a a vain, a vague attempt at trying to make things a wee bit uh, more kind of Christmassy around here. I'm actually a wee bit nervous about the tinsel around the VPUB compass here because it's not stuck on with anything. It's just kind of held in place with the weight of the compass. Uh, apologies, I'm getting that kind of start-stop thing that's happening with the software. Uh, it's happening a wee bit on audio as well, but hopefully it'll settle as the, as the stream goes on tonight. Don't know what the issues are. I do have my regular camera back, so we're back to the old focusing issues that we used to enjoy before I managed to break it a couple of weeks ago. Hey, I've also got Santa sitting up there on top of my uh, Whiskey of the Year. And what's really interesting about my camera's focus is that it sees Santa <laughs> and it thinks it's a person <laughs> and it keeps <laughs> trying to focus on it. So I've had to really kind of mess around <laughs> to try and make sure that the camera stays focused on me tonight. Um, so if you see me doing this and putting my head in front of my wee Santa up there, it's because I'm trying to attract the, this this focal point away from Santa and back onto me. Anyone, it's that time of year. Um, sorry, anyway, welcome everyone. It's that time of year that we can start to relax a wee bit and wind down uh, with drums with a, a wee bit more Christmassy feel. However, for tonight, that there is no... Um, uh, you know, my guest tonight is just going to be not going from any theme or feed from me. He's been told the five categories that we usually enjoy over uh, this session. We talk about a permashelf, we talk about a decadent pour, we talk about a crowd pleaser, we talk about uh, a VIP pour. We talk about very specific whiskies in order for them to bring forward what their interpretation of those categories are. And all the while that that's happening, we get to kind of... Um, you know, go off paste and talk about topics in any direction that we like, which means that if I do a decent job tonight, I might be able to dip in and out of the lounge and grab ad hoc questions from you guys too. So as always, just type Aquavite. It keeps, stay, keeps nice and orange for me. And I'm usually able to keep up with the, with the chat not too bad. If you've got any questions for the guest tonight, I'll try and pick them up as we go through. But that's it. We can just have a a chat, a general conversation, one whiskey geek to another, and just talk about anything that comes up whatsoever. You seem to have enjoyed the previous sessions I've done like this. We've had shoot backs that are on from uh, Inverhouse, of course, and more, more recently, I say recently, it wasn't that recent, we had uh, Scott Adamson from Tomatin. So, so Connell tonight is only actually our third for this platform, but still, I think it's a good platform. We'll give it another go tonight and hopefully we can keep doing it in the future. 
Right. I'm going to get into the lounge. I'm going to jump straight into the lounge in a second uh, to welcome all of you tonight as you get settled in. Um, there's a drama actually come in from uh, my pal Highland Hamish uh, up in Inverness. Uh, greetings from Aberdeen. Oh, sorry. He's in Aberdeen. He's saying, uh, long day of driving and wild weather. Only high point uh, was uh, visiting Aberdeen Whiskey Shop which had a fine Ardna uh, barrel top. I'm not getting you confused. You are Hamish from Inverness, aren't you? That's what the drive is. That's why you're travelling to Aberdeen, right? Uh, but you've bought me a wee dram, Hamish, and it's very, very nice to welcome you in. Thank you for your dram, buddy. Chris Brook is, is celebrating being a member of the VPUB uh, Barflies for 12 months. He's seen uh, even Aquaviti and Barflies, one year and counting. And Whiskey Central, Shayla is in tonight. Fantastic, Shayla. I believe you're in Arizona at the minute. Somebody told me you'd done a wee broadcast recently from Arizona. Uh, Sheila's saying, happy holidays, Roy. Thanks for putting on these lovely streams. Uh, thanks to you, Sheila. Thanks to Chris Brook. And thanks to Highland Hamish. Thanks to all of you. And welcome in tonight. Cheers. Before I do what I always do and uh, uh, jump into the lounge in order to... Uh, Welcome you all. I have to tackle something that's it's pretty sad. Last week, on the Friday after the VPUB went out last week, I got word through that we had lost one of our own. Uh, our friend, Big Al, from Whiskey Straight Al YouTube channel. When I say one of us, I'm talking about one of the video uh, creators on Whiskey Tube. Lost his battle, his long battle, with a condition that was attacking his lungs. Um, we were all holding vigil and hoping that he was going to pull through and find enough strength in order to make it forward uh, for the condition to be made better. But that wasn't possible. And Al lost his battle last Friday. It's super sad for all of us. It's super sad for the family. And it can't go unmarked. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to pour a Wild Turkey 101, and I think there's a lot of you out there will know exactly why I'm pouring a 101 for Al McVeigh. He was a fantastic guy, gregarious, generous, kind. He loved whiskey, and he loved people. And he loved being able to share whiskey through YouTube as well. Earlier on today, I was going through some of his videos, and I went back to some of the really, really early ones, and some of the more recent ones, and I compared just his journey on whiskey tube and how he was able to share it with us all. It's amazing to see and it's amazing to have that for posterity. And it makes us miss him probably all a wee bit more. What I'd like to do now is just ask everyone in the chat just to fall silent for a little bit, just for a minute, and reflect on how precious it all is and remember our dear friend from Northern Ireland. Thank you all. I'll raise this glass to you, big guy. You will be missed and you will be remembered. Cheers. Thank you all so much for your silence. Our thoughts are with the family, of course and generally all of us 
who Al touched over the time that we knew him. Okay, thank you all. I'll jump into the lounge and welcome some of you beautiful whiskey folk and dedicated barflies. It's great to have so many of you in. Wonderful to welcome you here for a regular uh, Thursday night. I'm going to scroll back a wee bit so I can catch some of the things that I've missed earlier. But Haro, Whiskey Weekend Dram is insane. I think I have to drink Arda Merkin tonight. I have two bottles for Aquavitae. Fantastic. It's glad, I'm glad that you've got those, but really you can sip anything at all tonight. I'm going to be sipping mostly Arda Merkin and Delphi type stuff because I have the feeling uh, that knowing Connell, and this is a focus has jumped again, I'll try and catch it and bring it back. <laughs> uh, knowing Connell, um, he'll be all over the place. I'm not really not sure what he's going to be bringing along. Um, but I'm glad that you have something on theme tonight, Harrow, and it's great to welcome you in. Ebhead Rolfi, St. Connell McKenzie, evening gents and all barflies. Good to have you, Rolfi, from Norway. Hello, all decent crowd and lovely tinsel touch. Yes, it's probably going to fall off throughout tonight, Gary, <laughs> because I forgot to stick it up. It's just sitting in place by the weight of the compass. So as long as there's no door slamming or drafts or anything, we should be okay, but it might fall down. Good to have you, Gary. Road to Drama saying good evening. Nice gaggle of Adelphi bottles back there. Aye, I, I, I dug out a few, uh, one or two Adelphis and a couple of Arbnas as well. Good to see you, Road to Drama. Uh, North Coast Drama is saying good evening, uh, uh, Aquavite and all the barflies. Hey, uh, good to see you in, Tony. It's wonderful to welcome you. Um, and just as it jumps, I'm so sorry, so sorry. Hell's Wed is saying Michael Henry enjoying the last drops of a fab Aquavite bottling. More please. So it looks like we might have uh, Michael Henry in tonight as well. Fantastic to welcome you, Helen, and Michael too. If you're in here, what is Whiskey Games? Matt is saying caught COVID at Christmas party the weekend, so watching from my bed, coughing and sneezing, but a wee dram is helping. Matt, I'm so sorry to hear, buddy. Get well soon, and I hope that that dram does its magic for you. Whiskey Wolf is saying good evening, Roy, and everyone else. I hey, hope you're all having a wonderful week so far. What's everyone's, what's in everyone's glass tonight? Kicking off the evening with a boon having 12 here. Good stuff, Whiskey Wolf. Hey, as good a start as any, my friend. I hope you're enjoying it. My friend Chris Banks Wildlife is in here. Good to see you. I uh, hope you're doing well, Chris. And I hope June is too. Hi, Roy. Had a good day today. Picked up a 10 and 15 year old spring bank from a local whiskey shop. It is out there, Chris, isn't it? We just have to kind of hope that the whiskey gods shine on us a wee bit and we can walk into the shop at the right moment when it's sitting there for us to pick up. The 10 year old I've noticed here and there. The 15, it's been a wee while since I've seen that green bottle on the shelf. Excess to Scotch, you're saying good evening, Ryan, a fellow bar flies from the Netherlands, Slancha. Good to have you in, buddy. I hope you're doing well. And Gene Kelly is saying hello, Aquaviti and fellow bar flies. Cheers from a small town just outside of Albany, New York. It's quite a wee bit far away from where I was in New York. I was just ever so slightly upstate. You're a wee bit further than me. I was in a place called New Paltz, eh, not so far from Poughkeepsie. The Hogsheads are saying good evening, Roy. Um, I was there for almost, I was there for some months, not quite a year. Uh, the hog says, Alex is in saying, good evening, Roy. I uh, hope you're well tonight uh, celebrating uh, passing my GCD. So I have a Deanston 2009 PX cask in the glass. Slancha. Alex, congratulations to you, my friend. Cheers. Well done. General certificate in distilling. Amazing. Uh, Alex has been working away while he's been studying up at Rassi Distillery uh, for quite some time now. Graham Young is raising a glass to Al, saying thank you for all the memories. That's amazing. Yes, fill the chat the chat with hearts, with uh, messages for the family, for for anyone who knew and enjoyed Al's company over the years. Um, amazing to see all your uh, kindness pouring forward. Molasses Mike is saying good evening, Roy, sitting here surrounded by Arda Merkins and Adelphi's. I've instructed my wife to take away my keyboard after the third cast strength dram. <laughs> That's good stuff, Mike. It's very wise too. And Graham Young is saying, cheers, Roy. Uh, that was a wonderful tribute to Al. Thank you very much, Graham. You're very welcome. Uh, Tom's Dram is saying, good evening, Roy, and all of you lovely whiskey folk. Good to have you in, Tom. Tom's Drams. Fantastic. All right. Knocking on for 300 of you in. Starting to wind up to that point where everybody's settled. They've got a glass poured and maybe sitting comfortably on their bar stool. Um, the fella I'm going to Welcome in tonight to sit and have a dram with throughout this evening. And I'm hoping that we can convince some, maybe bully him in to staying till the quiz at the end. Although it's quite an exciting night for him because uh, he's been traveling, traveling, traveling. And tonight, his, the rest of his team are sitting in the Whiskey Icons Awards right now. 
and they're starting to have a pretty good night because they've been pretty successful. We'll talk about that when we... Uh, the, the words are ongoing, but they're having a successful night so far. So we're even more lucky, I think, to have this fella hanging out with us tonight rather than there celebrating with his colleagues. I think most of you will know Conal McKenzie. You'll maybe know him from social media, but if you're lucky, you'll know him from a hosted tasting or you'll know him uh, through pouring drinks over a table at a festival and an event for you. You maybe have been lucky enough to bump in it in the distillery, who knows. But he's been around a wee while now and his face has become somewhat synonymous with Ardemurkin and the Delphi products. Every time I meet him and speak to him, I'm struck by the energy and how buzzing he is and how kind of into it all he seems to be. And you get the impression that he's one of these guys that is truly passionate about whiskey, much like the rest of us that are hanging out here tonight, which is, of course, why I reached out to him to see if he'd be up for stepping behind the bar for a, for a session to talk about his love of whiskey and what the industry drinks. Whiskey Malt Content has bought us a wee dram eh, to say thanks for another great V-Pub, Roy. Well, Vlad, eh, I hope that I can bring that to you tonight, and it's nice to have you in, and it's nice to have you buying my wee dram. Cheers to you, buddy. Yeah, thank you. Whiskey 101, I was right. Never fails to disappoint. So yes, he's more than happy to step forward. Um, I'm looking forward to hanging out with him tonight. So rather than leaving him sitting in the background for too long, let's reach out to Connell McKenzie from Adelphi and welcome him behind the bar. Connell, how are you doing? Hello, hello. How are you getting on? Brilliant. We can see you and we can hear you nice and clear, my friend. And it's nice to see you smiling. I'm going to get on to why we maybe need need to give you a bit of a bye tonight because you've had a hell of a calendar over the last few weeks that we'll get into in a wee while. But I'll start like I always do with a wee bit of an anecdote, Connell. Okay. For the first time you and I met, you don't remember. I do. I, it was at the Falkirk Whiskey Festival. You do remember. Why? <laughs> That's impressive. That's very impressive. Well, I was attracted to your table because you had some nice Adelphi bottlings sitting there, right? But this was only about a year, 18 months into the production at Ardemarkin. And you were super keen to talk about the spirit that you had there. It wasn't whiskey. It was in one of your opaque bottles, yeah. one of the slate bottles. And it was something, and I should remember better, my friend, you, you might remember better than I do. All I remember, it was from an octave. And you yeah. offered me a pour of this 18-month-old spirit, I think, very young. And I was absolutely knocked in my backside by just how completely dense and flavorful it was. To the point that I said, I need a bottle of this. And you said, oh, no, you can't buy this. It's sold out. It's gone. <laughs> it, would have been, it would have been 2018, that was. Um, 2018. And it'd be one of our spirit releases, I think. And yeah, it was yeah Falkirk Whiskey Festival. I remember it well. Well, I'm very, very flattered that you do remember it because uh, I remember it. And what came across was your glee, your genuine passion and excitement. Of course, you were happy and excited about all the Adelphi things that you were sharing that day. You might, I think that was the day that Rosebank was being shared as well. We were talking about the new Rosebank. They'd bought up some flora and fauna bottles and they were sharing that with everybody so they could taste some old Rosebank. And you and I were talking a wee bit about that, but what really got your 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 blood flowing, I think, was the ability for you to start exploring the spirit that was coming out of the peninsula up on the west coast, right from Ardenworkin, and it kind of stuck with me. Now, where are we today? <laughs> well, you've had whiskey out on the market for three and a half years now, which is nuts to think about, right? Yeah, that's when you put it like that. Yeah, I suppose it is. It was uh, September twenty twenty when we launched so yeah you're right okay so ju just uh, uh, three years and three months then september three, yeah three and a bit years three and a bit years i've actually yeah i've got your inaugural here that's all i have left of the second bottle of this yeah that's the 09 20 oh, yeah. well it's your first batch let's say of your core release product um still one of my favorites bizarrely it's fantastic stuff but to see that passion and then to have met you multiple times since and it's not disappeared in the slightest. 
one of the highlights of 2023 for me, in fact, it could still be the highlight of 2023 of my whiskey year, was that day in June up at the distillery on that cracking summer's day when we didn't enjoy much of the sun because we were inside the warehouse looking for a very specific cask. Oh, we had a wee bit of fun in the sun down with the jetty. Later in the day, once the hard work was done, <laughs> <laughs> we had a wee bit of fun in the sun, absolutely. Because we had worked really hard, we'd found not one but two casks, you remember. Actually, three, and we had to cut it down to two. We found, three, we found three and you were allowed one, but then somehow walked away with two. I don't know how you did that, but... Well, it was very late in the day before the negotiation started, and I think that was to my advantage. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Possibly, possibly. <laughs> yes. Um, listen, I don't. We the, the story about the Ardamurkin bottles released from me has been told quite a few times. We'll pick it up if anybody wants to ask about it tonight, of course. But generally, that's not what we're going to focus on. You're wearing your Ardamurkin fleece there. You're on brand tonight. You're here as Conor McKenzie, the sales director for Adelphi Distillery which obviously has the Delphi Independent Bottles under the umbrella, but also the distillery, Ardmark and Distillery as well. But if you don't mind, Connell, what I'm going to focus on tonight is talk about you. And if you're okay with that, we'll have a, a session talking about how you ended up where you are, what your thing is in whiskey, and see what we can tease. Nothing is off topic. You have made no conditions with me at all. Nothing is off uh, the, the topic list from you either. So it's one of those nice, comfortable wee sessions. Yeah. Let's let's, yeah, let's, let, let's frame it a wee bit. As a dram comes in from Jimmy Jazz saying, I spent a Friday night with Connell on Zoom chats with the London Whiskey Club during lockdown. He helped me make it through. So glad to spend a little time with him recently. Limburg and Boston. Aye. Nice to see you, Jimmy. You star, Jimmy. Thank you for the dram. And that's nice words for Connell as well. Nice to have you in, buddy. Cheers. Let's one. start it off with framing how you find yourself behind the bar at the V Pub. How did how did you get into whiskey, Connell? I know about your time down in New Zealand and things like that, but let's wind it back to the start. Oh, um, my background um, was travel and hotels, essentially. Uh, so eighteen, I left. I left home. hospitality. Yeah, uh, hospitality in in many forms. Like, I'm from Inverness, just outside a wee place called Culloden, if you know it. Um, not far from a battlefield, uh, yes. which uh, some battles fought many years ago. Yep. So I, I, that's where I that's where I'm from, uh, and randomly that's also where Graham Mackay, my colleague, is from as well. Uh, so yeah, from from Culloden, uh, travelled to Australia when I was 18. Bars, restaurants, hotels around there. Sort of got the travel bug. Visited and worked in Canada. Uh, traveled across the USA and then sort of last working holiday visa was New Zealand uh, and sort of settled in New Zealand for just under seven years working in hotels in Queenstown and Christchurch and there's a random business in Christchurch called Whiskey Galore yeah it's run by a chap called Michael Fraser Milne and his team there and I used to buy all my whiskey for the hotel from this this beautiful retail shop, um, a, a wholesale business and an imp import business, so they had they had it all in, in the family company. So they, they they were importing brands such as you know Kilholman, Springbank, Cadden Heads, Glen Farkless, Inverhouse Distiller uh, Distillers portfolio, uh, the Ben Reich Glen Dronach when it was under Dolly Walker's. Um, Tenure there, uh, the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, Douglas Lang, Hunter Lang, uh, Berry Brothers and Rudd, Gordon McPhail, and Adelphi. <clears throat> and so we used to get some nice um, whiskies through there. And I would frequent the shop um, quite a lot, and I got to know them quite well. So anyway, there, there you was were a, a whiskey lover yourself at this point. Oh, oh, yeah, I've been a whiskey, I've been a whiskey enthusiast for a very long time. Um, it's my is my father's tipple of choice, my mother's tipple of choice, my brother's tipple of choice, and many uncles' tipples of choice, which is not always the way in the Highlands or in Scotland, indeed, but in my family it is. Yeah. So, yeah, I used to I used to sort of rearrange all the whiskey lists in the the various hotels around the world I used to work at uh, to my sort of preference, if you will, and 
there was a job that that was that was that became available uh, at Whiskey Galore in Christchurch, and the opportunity came for me to leave the hospitality. Well, it's not because whiskey is still hospitality, but to leave the hotel industry um, to go and work in in whiskey. Uh, so I became their operations manager and and worked there for just over two years. And the only reason that we left, um, I left that that role, was. When my daughter was born, um, eighteen months, and it was just getting a little bit tricky out there with no family. Um, so we made the decision not to only just leave my role at Whiskey Galore, but my wife and I and our baby um, decided to move back to Scotland, um, which was the right move. Uh, but I came home without a job. Essentially, there was there was no role. Uh, wanted to remain in the industry. Had lots of contacts uh, through my my job at Whiskey Galore and yeah got home in may 2018 just in time for all the festivals to begin um basically went on a what i said to the missus a networking trip um around the Speyside festival the campbellton malts festival and the official and uh there was a few let's say there was a few opportunities uh but the yep. one that was uh most interesting for me uh was i had a a quick round of golf with Alex Bruce uh, at the Arasig Golf Course, um, just north of Arden Merkin. And uh, there was kind of a chat of what do you think about maybe joining the team? So that's where I, I, I did know that I was really keen to join the team at Arden Merkin and Adelphi. I just didn't know there would be a position. And that was it. I haven't looked back since, really. Um, joined as a sort of sales manager. Um, and and uh, now the director of the company and a wonderful team around me uh, and colleagues that we work with and yeah I just when you say it, it's three 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 years three months since a single malt was launched it's quite hard to believe <laughs> where, where it's yeah. all gone yeah where, and where you're obviously gone. you're well into your sixth year with the team as well now yeah Neil Cochran and St Connell's fantastic whiskey salesman and evangelist best I've met top bloke oh you've got a fan and Neil. Graham Fraser is saying, I'm seeing more of the market independent bottle shelf, bottlings on the shelf at six years old. How much has been released at independent bottlings? Quite an interesting philosophy they have at the distillery behind that, Graham, and a good one to talk about. Artificial frequency, frequencies. Uh, that's Daniel. Good to see you in Daniel. He's saying he should have an Aquavite T-shirt. Yeah, I don't know if I've ever gifted you one, buddy. I don't know. You have, actually. And do you know what? I was going to wear it, but I thought that might be a bit overkill. Nice. So let me, me, me turn it up with the fanboy Ardemarkin T-shirt on. Probably a good move. Keep that for the garden, buddy. But uh, aye, at least at least I've gifted you one. Good to have you in, Daniel. Celtic Drama is saying he's a dodgy guy who went to a dodgy school. Uh, lol, Connell McKenzie. So uh, obviously in Gary, you've got somebody that was probably at the same school as you as well. Daniel, uh, well, Gary didn't go to the same school, but his uh, my kid uh, goes to the same school as Gary's kids. So <laughs> ah, see, I see, I see. Daniel Williams is saying I uh, had the pleasure of meeting Connell in the Hague last year at the festival. It was a great chat and masterclass, an absolute pleasure. He's bought me a wee dram as well. Daniel Williams, thank you very much for your dram. I'm glad you had some fun with Connell. Okay, I want to pick you up on that joining the team. Because I throw a cheeky question in here to kick things off for this platform quite regularly in order to just get a reaction from you. But it's a wee bit more for when I ask you this question. True or false, you have the best job. Now, that, that's just to kind of broach this idea that being some, as part of your role as sales director, there's a lot of brand uh, ambassador type work that you have to do. You're often very front and center when it comes to presenting the brands and presenting our marketing and, and all of that kind of face-to-face -face thing. That's very much seen as a dream job for a lot of people. Perhaps a lot of people that don't realize just how much pressure and spreadsheets and sleeping in airports and things like that's involved. We'll get onto it, I'm sure. But I think the reason that this is a wee bit more cutting for you is because I have gotten to know the Ardemarkin team over the last few years. And I would say that it's a cracking place and team to be working amongst as well. So not just talking about this idea of you being a whiskey ambassador, but we're talking about you being an Adelphi whiskey ambassador as well. Counter that. Tell us, is it true or false, Connell? You've got, you've got the best job. 
Actually, I think I've got the best job, but we're not talking about me. We're talking about you tonight. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's, it's without doubt true. Um, I, I, I count my lucky stars every day um, that you know I get to do what I do, and I'm, I, I'm very grateful for the opportunity that I have. Um, and I, a lot of all my teams say the same thing. Uh, certainly my sales and marketing team say the same thing. Um, I mean, we're not a big team. You know, production to sales and marketing, we are... 34 all told i mean that is yeah. quite tight uh, that's quite tight uh so that's well, Ardemark and adelphi down that, the that's right? American, that's adelphi that's the board you know that's everyone so we we run a pretty tight ship and um, sometimes i would say too tight um but hopefully alex is not watching um but uh yeah we um yeah i do have, I, I the reason why i think it, I, have, I have one of the best jobs out there even in the whiskey industry, is that I've got this great liquid to work with from Arden American, but also I get to select casks for Adelphi as well. So yes. it's not just I would I, I I love exploring Arden American. There's so much more to 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 deep dive into that spirit as it matures, as it goes into different casks, as we experiment with barley varietals, yeast varietals, ca you know, cask types, fermentation times, you name it. But I also just get to work with some cracking liquid from around the world with Adelphi single casks. So yeah. every day is a school day. You know, it's not repetitive in any way, shape, or form. And yeah, I get to wear my heart on my sleeve and and and, and talk about our American around the world. As you know, I've just come back from China, uh, Taiwan, and I was in Milan two days ago. So it's it's it funny because stopped. you and I were talking about you know this session and what we were going to cover and things like that just through direct message and I said to you when I worked out through your social media that you were actually messaging me from the far east I said well when are you home and you said the 24th I said right okay we'll speak when you go home don't worry and then I start to speak to you again and realize that you're in Milan <laughs> And it kind of just, you you no sooner had you got back home and unpacked and maybe got a chance to go over the jet lag from the Far East, but you're very, very quickly down to Southern Europe there. And it hit home very, very quickly. This is a demanding job as well, Connell, right? Yeah, look, it's it's not all uh, sunshine and lollipops, but it's, you know, the majority is. But, you know, when it's time away from the family um, can be tough um, and, you know, it can be quite lonely at times as well. Uh, and sometimes, you know, when you just don't want to go and do a tasting or a day in the trade and retail, it can sometimes be a bit of a drag. But, you know, when you when you weigh it against the positives, the positives always win. So, you know, it's, um, yeah, if, every job has its, its downsides, but mine, thankfully, well, I'm, I'm very lucky. I did a lot of travel. And, and in fact, I did a lot of travel for the company I'm going to talk about right now, because this is crazy to me. This is a world's collide type moment, Connell, but... Uh, you were at the Milan Festival, and one of my ex-colleagues, the company I worked for before I do this now, I worked for them for 21 years, he sends me this. This is my pal Vittorio, who's over in Milan at the festival, and he's just pointing to the Ardna Merkin booth. And I said, oh, that's cool, he's at the Milan Festival. But then I go to the message from you, which is immediately next to it, and I get this image of, obviously, it's perhaps not going to focus I'll try my best but there he is in the background with his dad and his dad is a guy I worked for for that those 21 years and in the front is obviously you and Antonia so this is my old world and my new world colliding in the same space I'm very grateful that, in your thoughtfulness for sending me that picture it really made my day quite fantastic to see but again I'm reminded about the fact that you're not especially with a young family Connell like like when I was traveling it was so difficult it must be tough for you. How long are you home for now? That's me home now. I'm going to try and basically take leave as soon as possible this month. And uh, I don't go away till mid-January. Um, so, which is unusual for me, to be fair. I, I don't usually go away January, February, but um, there's a trip. I'm going with, uh, with my colleague, Carl. We're going over to uh, the USA, Canada, and Mexico, would you believe? So... All ticket, but you've got about three or four, well, five, four or five weeks actually before you need to kick it all off again next year again. Yeah, yeah, no, I have a proper break with the family, so I'm looking forward to uh, it. Get yourself reacquainted with the family and friends back home. Quite amazing. Yeah. On my own, on my own pillow. Yeah, it would be nice. <laughs> exactly. How much you miss your own bed? It's quite incredible, right? 
Um, mm -hmm. Mike Molasses is saying, having worked 20 years in sales, it's fantastic to be in that line of work when you're selling something that people love and they're clamoring for. Absolutely no doubt. It's easy when you're passionate about it, right? Uh, and Peter Lee is saying, uh, it was a, a year today when we met the, uh, the Monday whiskey hunter fill, filled our cask. Um, I've not had the opportunity to buy Connell a dram, so here's one to my two legends from Graham Young and Gino Kimo, Denise and I. Ah, okay, that's from Peter Lee. He bought us a wee dram to celebrate his cask filling a year ago. So time goes by very, very quickly, Peter, doesn't it? You've only two more years to wait, and you'll not be tasting spirit anymore. You'll be tasting a eh, whiskey. Is the cask sales program at Ardmorkin still going, Connell? How does it work? It basically works like this. Every year we say, are we doing casks this year? And we all kind of say, well, we said we wouldn't do it again last year. And then we end up looking at the waiting list that we have and getting guilted into opening it up again. That's basically the way it works. Um, so, yeah, we, we open it up from usually 50 to maybe a maximum 80 to 100 casks a year. No, no more than that. Um, and it's basically on a, an allocation basis because the, the waiting list that we have from the previous years gone on too long. But uh, yeah, basically, if you are interested, obviously you can you can reach out uh, to, to Vicky. Well, I think if I understand well, it also gives you an administrative headache going forward as well. Because if you do fifty casks every year, or between fifty and hundred, it quickly adds up, right? Yeah, it is. It is. Um, it is a nightmare um, to put it, to put it lightly. Uh, but we've got so someone very able managing it, and they're doing it very well. Good. The the only thing I would say about it was, you know, we when we built Arden American, we we were pretty much against, not against, but we just we kind of wanted to focus on whiskey, so we didn't do the gin thing. Yes. Uh, so, as you well know, and everyone in the in the in the beep hub tonight will know, it is quite an expensive thing to make whiskey, and you've got to kind of wait. And you know, yes, you could release it three. We didn't do that. We waited until six years. So we waited, you know. We waited double the amount of time. So that's a lot of money going into labor, barley, casks, power, everything. So a little bit of cash flow, which we got from um, selling some private casks, um, was very welcome at the time, to be honest. So it was a well worth uh, exercise. And not only just from a cash perspective, you, you, you're, you're welcoming people into the story, into the into your journey from the get go. And yes. um, I think a lot, a lot of people, a lot of people who who, who purchased the cask of Arden American they're almost like brand ambassadors for us anyway. So I think it was a really good um, concept and we're, we were, del we're delighted and make people, f uh, people who come and visit us who are cask owners, obviously very welcome to, to come out West and see us. Uh, yeah, I've always been made very welcome up there. It is fantastic and it's true. It doesn't matter who, who seems to be on uh, uh, that particular day, but it's, it's a great spot to go, quite a distance to go as well. Uh, and it's hard to keep your attentions, attention on the road because the scenery is just so absolutely stunning as well. Colin Mears has bought us a dram to say, great to see you, Connell. Thanks, as always, uh, for the great content at Aquavita. I'm able to watch a whole VPUB live for once as I'm home, patiently awaiting the birth of our baby girl, getting into squeaky bum time. Colin Mears is down in New Zealand, Connell. So let's raise yes, a glass. I know, I know Colin very well. Oh, you do? You know him? Fantastic. Uh, best of, very best of luck when it comes along, Colin. Cheers to you. Mm. Let's get into your questions because I'm going to pour something, Connell, that's a permashelf item for me. Now, this is, as I've already mentioned, was your first release. It doesn't have to be a, uh, something, the first release for me that's permashelf. Any Ardemarkin AD core range will do. I've got quite a lot of them over the last few years. I love the stuff. I really do enjoy it. None more, I think, than this first one for me. I wasn't expecting anything from this when I poured it. It was just another one of these new whiskies back in 2020. My goodness, I was mistaken. Yes, there's youth here. Yes, it's a young whisky. I think this is five years old, this particular one. Something of that order. But I could not believe the that sense of the west coast of Scotland that was coming out of this glass. It was incredible. All that kind of outdoor the light peat, the the sense of kind of salinity, that coastal, the minerality, all the things that we enjoy in the majority, the DNA that links the majority of Ardemarkins today was present from that very, very first sip. It's an absolute blinder. And that's going to be my permashelf pick tonight, Connell. But I'm asking you, 
Connell McKenzie, the whiskey enthusiast, if you have to pick, and, out, and I'm not going to make any conditions here, you can pick from your own portfolio or you can pick outside of it. It's entirely up to you. But if you have to put forward and recommend to a fellow whiskey geek enthusiast something that might end up being a bottle that they finish and almost immediately, re- re- that's the definition of a permashelf bottle, finish it and almost replace it immediately, what is Connell McKenzie putting forward? It's, this isn't it. It's just from the same distillery because I can't seem to get my hands on on uh, on it. So I'm actually gonna I'm gonna open it tonight because I haven't I haven't uh, I've been through one of these. Um, oh, fantastic, fantastic! This this if it, if I was being true, uh, it would be the Springbank Ten. Um, <laughs> that, is, that, that is my perma shelf, but it's not currently a perma shelf because I can't buy it. Or at least I haven't had time to look to buy it. Um, yes. So I will I will talk about <laughs> or talk about it with Campbellton Lock. So there you are. Absolutely terrific. A good choice. A very popular choice amongst the community recently as well, because it lets us grab that Campbelltown uh, I don't know experience uh, that have a Campbelltown whiskey on the shelf without the challenges and without paying through the nose, of course. What I will say to you, Connell, is that if you've noticed on auctions recently, the Springbank 10 is going for very, very close to retail and there's been a lot of it around in recent months. Not up to speed on auctions, but I've noticed that, uh, generally speaking, so if you are desperate for it. But it's interesting to hear that somebody in the industry suffers the same struggles trying to get hold of product as everyone else because at the end of the day, most of the time you've got to walk into a shop and pick up what you fancy too, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, a lot of the time I spend, if, 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 I'm, if I'm fancying a dram of an evening, a lot of the time I might be looking at cask samples that, you know, I'm, I might need to look at for work purposes or selection purposes or whatever it may be. Um, but, you know, a, a dram for an enjoyable dram of an evening, a dram that I need to have something from is is is, is usually Springbank. And it's it's usually Springbank 10. I'm pretty disappointed, actually. I'm going to have to get one before Christmas now. But, uh, yeah. Um, Campbell well, in order for it to be a perma shelf, it has to be permanently on your shelf. So you're well, not in panic. I know. Panic. I've completely uh, ruined that, really. Uh, but I was, actually, I was going to say this, too, but I don't want to be that guy that's always on brand. But, yeah, I always, always have a bottle of, of core release um at arm's length as, as i've said uh, we won't you're, you won't be judged well you might be judged on your picks absolutely but the intention is not to judge you and if you want to pick up your own bottles and put forward your own product none of us really have a problem with that they understand the dynamics of the vpub well enough now to know that that's a genuine thing and i would say as somebody's already mentioned in the chat tonight connell if you're genuinely holding up your own stuff and so glad and grateful to have it and you're drinking your own stuff, that says a lot. It really does. So I think it's absolutely fine. Eh, I've picked it as my perma shelf item tonight. And again, this is I would say that this is maybe one of the lightest, one of the least cask forward of the core range that there's been, that original release. Um It'd be nice if there was, if there was. I mean, you must be into filling some refills now, right? Some you're, you've 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 emptied out some of those first fall bourbons, and they're back through the system now to be filled up again. That's happening, right? Yeah, no, we we've, we've been filling twenty to twenty five percent every year in refill casks for the last five years, six years. So, Terrific. yeah, so I think you know we're a great believer in a refill cask, I and mean, there's nothing better on earth than. A refill bourbon with a bit of age, refill sherry. I mean, for, there's a reason. We, first fills do their job and they do it well. But you know, if you ask me, if you if you had a gun to my head, I would tell you refill bourbon without a shadow of a doubt. Distillate shining and good cast cast conversation is is the way to go. And um, for me, um, just a wee bit of time. Yeah, and a bit of time. Yeah, there's no there's no rush. And a bit of Scottish climate as well. Honestly, it seems to work just really really well, and it's. I'm very, very grateful for a, a bit of distillery wood, a bit of refill cask. Hence the bottlings that you and I ended up doing together earlier this year to, to try and showcase that whole thing. That when we talk about refill, it's not like it's almost like we're saying a used cask, but when everything else we talk about the previous incumbent and celebrate the previous incumbent, Palo Cortado, PX, Bourbon, and talk about it being first fill and all of these things, what we're really talking about with a refill cask, depending on the provenance of the whiskey, can often be 
an ex-Scotch whiskey cask, and that can be a good story too. Um, I'm glad that there's a lot of attention being put to refill casks because I can see that as your whiskey ages being really quite a powerful, important thing for you to leverage. I'm excited about the future as well, and I don't see this permashelf bottling for me disappearing anytime soon. Talking about that, talking about just, and if I hold this up a wee bit here, I don't know if you're able to see just how pale a whiskey this is. This is really quite light. It's maybe just a touch darker than, I'd say, a Chardonnay or something. It's very, very pale gold. If you don't mind me just throwing in a bit of a controversial prompt for you while I pick up one or two of the comments, have a wee think about this. They hold a vote for or against adding colour to Scotch whiskey going forward. How do you vote? How does Connell McKenzie vote? Against adding? I can't believe you actually asked that question. I need to ask it. We don't. I mean, adding colour to whiskey is absolutely insane um, in, in my head. Um, and I know that I know people. I, I, there's, I've got friends who work for distilleries who who, who who do this. I don't want to be too out there with my opinion, but I just just genuinely don't believe in it at all. I mean, Arden America and Adelphi, we don't even have the equipment to do it. So even if we wanted to do it, um, oh, that's chill filtering. What we're talking about? Um, yes. No, no but, but the same. I mean, you need to have the big bottle the big you have to be able to decant this caramel in the right quantities and yeah, add it i'm to just i'm just i'm just not up for it i mean i just feel it's like pulling pulling the wool over someone's eyes and uh i just think there's too much good whiskey out there that we can all you know we can just crack on with it you know and 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 and, and uh, there's no need uh, and i think a lot of the new, all the basically all the new distilleries and a lot of, of of other distilleries in Scotland are are taking that 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 road. There's there's not that there's not as many I think as there used to be, and um, distilleries adding colour and chill filtering. It, okay, it happens, but uh, yeah, it's not my bag. I I think almost to temper you and I's opinion on this. I think if you imagine the mass market, they don't really appreciate what the true colour of whiskey is, especially when it's sold fairly young from uh, well-used casks, let's say. I think there's an argument for consistency when it comes to huge-scale mass-market products such as a blend, a ubiquitous blend or something like that. I can see the argument, but when it comes to something that's sold as a natural product, something that's sold as a traditional product, maybe even, dare we say, a craft product or something like that, then surely there's an argument that we should embrace variation in different colours, batch to batch and things. Single malt whiskey, small batch whiskey, that type of thing. And I think you guys are doing a very, very good job in clear bottles most of the time, putting your product forward and showing everyone that it's actually quite a pale liquid. And it can taste all really, really fabulous for it. Have you ever heard anyone come up to you and say, oh, it's looking a bit peely wally. It's a bit pale. Has it ever happened? Uh, no, actually. Not me personally. Um, yeah, I mean, the core, the core is a light gold color, I suppose, straw like in, 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 in way. But yeah, look, I think I probably went a wee bit heavy there. I, I, I just, for us. Well, I don't we, think so. I'm, 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 I was lit up. That you went in the way that, the way that you did it was, <laughs> yeah. it was perfect. Yeah. But it I, was, but I mean, if we we are we are in a very fortunate position, you and I, that most of the time we are sipping really nice single malt whiskeys, small batch. I mean, even this is your the biggest batch that you do, and what are you bottling about fifteen thousand bottles at a time? Is it something of that order? It's still very uh, very small. twenty five thousand up to twenty five now. Amazing, right? But that, in the big scheme of things, compared to the big boys out there, that's a drop in the ocean, right? Yeah, I know. And, and that's all we ever will be. But it's um, what I love about what we do is, you know, when it's the same blending team that, 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 that put each batch together. We always compare it against previous batches. We do the blind test. None of us get it right, which means that we're doing something right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, 46.8 and chill filtered natural colour. Uh, yeah, it's, it's never going to be a massive 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 brand i mean we we're only we're making 400,000 only i mean that's that's a reasonable size for a small yes. facility but uh 400,000 liters of alcohol is what we're producing 
So, but compared to the bigger guys, you're right. It's a, a complete drop in the ocean. Absolutely. Absolutely. Listen, I'm glad there's a, there's enough of it. It seems to be sticking a wee bit longer. It, we're at the point now we can walk into our local retailer these days and actually pick up most, more, most of the time, maybe not all the time. There's a good chance there's going to be at least one example of Arden working on the shelf. And that's a good, good place to be in. Um, you seem to have struck the balance right as well. Um, I'm going to touch upon that a wee bit later because I'm going to have to get in another couple of crunchy things with you about price and things like that as well. But I know that none of it's going to phase you. Um, Keith McDonald's has bought us a wee dram. Sorry, I almost missed that. Keith, he's saying, here's a dram from the McDonald brothers. Cheers, Connell and Roy. Thanks, if Keith. That's same, if that's the same Keith McDonald, I'll be Keith McDonald from New Jersey. That's amazing. That's amazing. If You're going to win a lot of friends tonight. That is amazing. And I think is, it's, Keith, Keith and Michael McDonald, and I'm I was sure just, they, they came to, amazing. to me in, uh, in New Jersey. Amazing. Yes. So he's it's, uh, Keith and Michael, yes. And I've some, I have sometimes got a message from Michael, I sometimes got a message from Keith. And it took me a wee while to work out when one of them admitted that they were actually brothers as well. But I think that's going to, they're going to be made up that Conor McKenzie in Inverness remembers the boys from New Jersey. Uh, cheers, Keith. Thanks for the drama, friend. Cheers. All the best to Michael, too. Um, Julian Rickman is saying, Where do we get those great looking Ardemarkin whiskey glasses Connell has? Looks very funky. Are you using the Spiegel sniff? Yeah, them? so I've got a Glen Cairns, but I just thought since we're pouring some nice drums, th these are we, we we sell these in the um, online or in our uh, our, our visitor center shop. Yeah, they're, they're called the Spiegel uh, snifter glasses, and they honestly are just it's, it's it's almost like just a Glen Cairn with a stem, but there's it's got a, a good chimney on it, so we use these for blending as well. But they're just nice to just have a drum in, so. I have to say I love them. I picked up two the last trip at Ardemarkin and I need to get more. Yeah. Um, they're always sitting there. They're, they've become a favourite kind of tasting glass these days. Do you know what I love about it? Like you say, it's got a good, good size on it and there's a lot less head tipping happening as you sip it yeah. because it's got a nicer opening, you know, a slight exactly. bigger yeah, opening, I just, right? They're very comfortable uh, drinking glasses for a in a professional capacity but also in a dramming capacity. So for me, they tick all the boxes. Um, and they come out the dishwasher amazingly well. I've always been a wee bit nervous about because I was hand washing, but there's so many dirty glasses that I just gave up and went for the dishwasher. Uh, they're they're fairly ones. durable. They're not they're not indestructible like a Glen Cairn, but they are they're yeah. fairly durable. Yeah. Well, the two I've got are still intact. That's it. I'm going to break it this weekend. But there you go. Always a nerd on the shelf, says Hellswood, uh, either from the core range or the. Limited editions, fabulous drams, Aquavite and Connell McKenzie, fantastic. Jimmy Legg is in tonight, good to see you, big guy. He's saying, it seems as though Connell may be in the right job. Remembering people like that is a remarkable feat. It is indeed, I'm impressed. Whiskey Wolf is saying, can those tasting glasses be ordered outside of the UK? Uh, do you ship across borders? No, sure. No, no glasses, no. I wouldn't do that. Uh, I wouldn't take you just need to, to make the pilgrimage. But Spiegel is, they ship internationally the you might not get the Ardemarkin branding on it right but you can you can order the snifter directly from the, the Spiegel website no doubt uh, they are not the cheapest but I think I paid 20 quid for a pair which wasn't bad at all for the quality of glass that, yeah yeah I was I'm quite happy to pick up more um, and I know that when I pour somebody want a dram in it they like it too it's nicely weighted there's a good balance and like you say Connell it's just a nice maybe indulgent hey uh, uh, glass to have a dram in. Let's move on to uh, talking about um, you remembering people's names and making folk in the, the lounge tonight feeling a bit chuffed. Um, let's move on to the crowd pleaser, Connell. Do you know what I mean by a crowd pleaser? You you must know, uh, and I have to take my hat off you as well, I'll blow a bit of wind up your skirt while I've got you on. I've had the pleasure of enjoying hosted tastings from you a couple of times as well, not just personal one-on-one -on -one things, but where you're actually standing up in front of a room, again, the passion comes across. You've always got a wee story to tell about the, the bottles that you're pouring as well. People really enjoy it. And what I notice about it is also you have that great ability to keep everything planted down to earth and full of humour as well. Really making whiskey feel like it's accessible. We don't need to be all really uptight and analysing our whiskey to the nth degree. Just making it a laid back thing, not forcing anything on anyone. It's always good fun. So when you're in that environment, you know exactly what a crowd pleaser is, right? 
you know that there ha there's always those whiskies that you've got some really experienced folk in. You've got some people that have maybe only had a couple of sips or maybe nothing at all. And then you've got all the gradients in between and you've got to try and find something which is difficult that's going to have everybody just sagely nod. Is that a hard one for you? It, it was. I mean, I, I did. When you sent me through the, the list, I had to really think about it. And... Uh... And yep. I've selected this because I had a, when was it? It would have been just for my daughter's birthday. We had a bit of family round and they stayed on for a wee bit. It was past the cup of tea and cake time. And I was like, oh, it's at the point where I need to offer a dram. Uh, yeah. So there was a varied audience and people who just would not like an Ardemurkin uh, because it's too peaty for them. Yep. Um, the, you know, Isla, forget it. Um, anything come overly, you know. But I had a bottle of this, and I thought this could go one or two ways. Uh, I I love it. I think it's a great whiskey. It's not um, that accessible. It, it sells out quite quickly. Um, but sometimes we get access to it. Um, and my the whiskey I poured. It wasn't actually this one, but it was from. Ooh, you you spoil your guests. You spoil your guests. Which one is that? It's just a wee bit. This is the 2010 uh, 12 year old um, cask strength. So I think I might have had this, but I think I poured my guests the 46 percent one. Right. Okay. Um, but I've got a few. But I've got a few bottles of Daphne, um and they're all open, and I, I very much enjoy uh the style and the care tender lover care that uh, francis uh puts into um uh, his whiskey and i think i think it's i think it's fantastic well i tell you what i'll do in honor of that i'll reach over and this is the bottle i opened when francis was on uh, it's a wee bit different from yours uh, this is the the winter batch release at 46 percent um uh, but it's. It, I'm very, very glad to have a, another wee daft mill on the shelf open again, and uh, and I'll just before I go into the, the the lounge, I'll mention that you remember that sunny day we were talking about earlier. You mm. brought along one of your daft mills to share with us that evening. Very, very generous, Connell. We didn't. I thought, let... I thought that might have prompted the story. <laughs> uh, and just, just before we go down that story, I can see Greg's whiskey guide saying, "Not for the price." Um, yeah, fair enough. Um, it's it, it's it, it, it's a bit high, um, possibly, but uh, I don't get to buy a lot of whiskey. Um, you know, I, I I buy my own whiskey. I get I, I, as you can imagine in this role, you get access to a lot of whiskey at probably favourable prices, right? We get good staff prices at Ardmore and Adelphi, but when I want to buy a whiskey, I'm pretty I'm, I I uh, I think a lot about it and, and what I want to buy. And you know, Daphne, if I ever get a chance to buy it, um, I, I usually click click the button on it. So, um, well, I don't. I, I'm like I'm like you, Connell, and I don't chase bottles, and I'm very mindful of the price. We spend a hell of a lot of time talking about price and focusing on price in the VPub. Every now and again, we need to indulge ourselves and remember yeah. that this, this isn't a grocery shopping here. We're drinking whiskey, and it's a very indulgent and expensive hobby, even at, even at the entry level. Um, and once we get really into it, what we need to realise is that one of the greatest things about whiskey is how it reminds us of how amazing it is just to be alive. And sometimes that means indulging ourselves in something, as Greg is absolutely quite rightly pointing out, is a wee bit more expensive, especially if we if we truly love it. I think that it's been a long time since I've had a daft mill available to pour for myself or anyone in the, in the house. And Francis coming on was a great excuse for me to get this one opened. And I've been very lucky that a, a mutual friend of ours managed to get me one of these at retail, which was just mind-blowing that I could even have something like this. This is going to be my Christmas whiskey. In fact, it might be one that I'll open in one of the V-pubs towards the end of the year. Um, I do accept what Greg's mentioning about the price there, but it's difficult for me. I'll venture it's difficult for you and even Greg that if somebody comes along to us and says, right, I can't afford Daphne, but I want something that tastes like it. <laughs> where do you send them? 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It, it's it's like I, there are some that are kind of similar in certain ways. Certain batches are a wee bit more kind of daft milly than others. Maybe there's a few distilleries and a few products out there, but really, it's quite a unique wee thing, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why I pulled it because I think it's a it's a really clean, well made spirit in in good casks. I, I like daft mill and bourbon casks. That's my that's my preference, um, and. Yes. I, I just think it's so solid the distillate, and I think it's a I think it is a crowd pleaser for that reason. I don't think there's a, there's a risk when you pull that out. I don't think there's a risk. Well, um, especially when that crowd is aware of how much you're treating them, because you can tell them that anybody that does pick up a daft mill with the right hand can sell it on in their left hand and make a wee bit of money out of it in order for them to go buy go off and buy another bottle of whiskey and end up with it for free. The fact that you that we're that we are not are choose not to do that and to drink it and share it with people as well is just something that's a treat and something that we can enjoy uh, and I think it's worth it. Um, Jimmy Legacy, is he really thinking about what he's buying? He must have a stash of Cochran. Jimmy Legacy's a big Cochran fan, as you perhaps know. Um, <laughs> maybe I wonder if you've preempted something there, Jimmy. It looks like there's something. It's uh, the Sherry Cast Cast Trend, uh, 56.9 you've got there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's the that's the really dirty one as well. And Gordon Fraser is saying, uh, the day we realised how unnaturally buoyant the big floaty Carl is, Aquaviti and Connell McKenzie, that's the, the obviously the day that you brought that uh, daft mill down to the pier to share with us, Connell. And the... I, that was, you know, without going on about it, and I don't know if you've talked about it before, but that was one of those whiskey moments. Um, it was spectacular light. Um, as It was sort of, it was the end of summer. Was it August? I can't remember. No, it was it was June. Was it June? It was June, June but it was it wasn't it, even it was, summer yet. It was just starting. Yeah, we'd had a nice spell of warm weather. We hoped it would hold. Um, we came up early that morning. We did what we had to do in the day. Um, we were going to we were going to uh, stay over that night. So obviously, we we can't drive home from the peninsula after doing what we did done after that day. day in the warehouse. Yeah, that's you were going to cook us a wee bit of tea. So what we did is we went down and jumped in Loch uh, Sunart, as, as well, which sounds idyllic, and it looked idyllic because it was beautifully tropical and turquoise and clear, and the sun was setting, and it was amazing. But we jumped into the loch, and of course, it's like you're being stabbed by a million knives all at once because it's just so bitter. Like you're used to it now, perhaps, but um, um, no, not really. <laughs> um, I've been in that. I've been in that loch with several people in the whiskey industry, and. The only person that loves it and just wants to keep going back in and back in and back in is Angus McGrailed. Uh, Angus McGrailed. <laughs> he just loves it. He, he's just not born for wild swimming. But uh, <laughs> yeah, look, it's, it's an exhilarating experience, but it's not warm. Well, I encourage anybody, if they go up to the peninsula, take a pair of shorts with you because it's uh, it's a bit more uh, graceful than doing it in your underpants. But, you know, needs must sometimes, right? Um Take a towel, just go down, find a spot, jump in, swim out again. It's fabulous. Make sure the weather's good, of course. Uh, but it is just amazing. It doesn't need to be there. The Morkin Peninsula, of course, can be anywhere. There's just these gorgeous spots all over Scotland. And it's given me a wee bit, a wee bit more bravery to just jump in to these inviting waters. Um, Graham Fraser saying, interestingly, Francis always says his favourite whiskey is Rosebank, and that was his aim for Daft Mill. I'll always remember that he was aiming for that style, but he's only ever done double distillation, right? Um, and that's all he's intended to do. And Marcel is saying, Marcel Kings Drams is saying, is that 2008 Daft Mill cast strength that Connell showed? The one from Facebook fan group, people in the industry also being in such groups. I love it. So that's I don't... 10, 58.7. It's not. It's fifty-eight point seven. It says under in small writing. It says the friends of Facebook under it. So the friends no. of Daft Mill, sorry, Facebook group. It says under it. No, it's not. So that. it's not that one. No. It's just the cast. The cast strength limited edition, twenty-four hundred bottles. Yeah, Greg's whiskey guy is saying I can't afford it if I like. It's just not to buy two other whiskies instead. No problem. It's just me. I don't see it often here. Currently, only twenty ten winter release at forty six percent. And I know Greg over in France, you're probably paying a wee bit more again. Fast graph is saying I once swam in the Baltic Sea in February. I can do that, Lock. Okay, that was twenty five years ago. And I wonder how much as we get a wee bit older, we're affected by that thing. Okay. I've got another tricky one. I'm going to make the questions a wee bit easier as we go on, buddy. But here's another one for you specifically. And I think it's appropriate to ask you this thing. 
whiskey is ever more expensive. What now? Let me give you a wee anecdote. I went through a project recently on the VPUB to talk about pushing the boat out a bit and spending a wee bit more to treat yourself over Christmas. And where I would normally be focused on 21 and 24 and maybe even pushing it to a 25-year-old whiskey for between 100 and 150 pounds, as recently as two. To, <laughs> I know Apologies, that. that'll be the way for <laughs> Um We were able to afford those as recently as two and a half to three years ago. We're now down in the 16, 17, 18 year old ballpark for the same price. It's just the way it is. It's moving very, very quickly. And it's feeling a wee bit like we're being throttled and choked and pulled back from the things that we used to really enjoy treating ourselves with. Whiskey generally is becoming more expensive. It's been happening for a long time with the older age statements, but we've noticed it happening on the younger whiskies too now as well. It's not uncommon for to pay 60 quid for a brand new whiskey, three, four years old. It's not uncommon to pay um, 50, 55, 60 quid for a five, seven year old age statement. It's just the, the way that we're living right now. You as somebody who walks into your local whiskey retailer to pick up your whiskey as well as pick up uh, your staff, your own staff discounts and things like that. I'm sure you are also noticing the price crunches as well. And you're also frontline, so you get feedback from the folk that's buying it. Are we at the peak yet, or have we still got a way to go? What's your gut? First of all, I'm going to turn off that Alexa. <laughs> Just rip her out the wall. <laughs> Horrible thing. Or either that, I'll start shouting, Alexa, order me a bottle of Daft Mill. <laughs> Sorry, there's none in stock. Yeah. No, I need to let, let the dog through to see the missus. Um, Aye. Uh, where do I begin with that? It's a heavy one, buddy, but it's the heaviest question that you'll have to answer tonight, I think. I well, first of all, yes, it is expensive. Um, unfortunately, cost of production this year past has been one of the one of the worst we've had. I mean, energy, barley, everything's been really, really quite expensive. Um, from from a self selfish point of view, from our American, we haven't really seen seen that as much as everyone well not as everyone else but as maybe other suppliers are we we, we we've kept our we, we source a lot of our own barley you know as you know 60 70 yep. percent we're we run by biomass from the estates we so our our cost per liter has been not as bad maybe as other facilities i hope that we're reaching a peak now um that whiskey will sort of maintain you know I, I don't think it needs to i mean you're right how can how can whiskies and um, new facilities justify some pricing and I, i've got to be reasonably careful of what i say here um because you know i don't want to come across as bad mouthing any other um no uh, facility or brand however what i will say is that we when we released our inaugural single malt which we didn't put on the label we didn't do any inaugural stuff we just went out with a our, our whiskey when it was ready it was 45 pounds now it would still be 45 pounds if we, there was there didn't decide to be a duty increase uh, recently so it's gone up a wee bit with with in line with duty but we're trying to we're trying to price our whiskey to drink and as simple as that um so your core range be, what, what's, the, what's the recommended retail of your core range today it's 48 pounds 48 40, uh, yeah 48.95 i think is the, the max we ask people okay to go yep. to. So basically keeping it under the 50 pound mark with that with that with that duty increase um there should not be and there has been a few but there should not be any Arden american release um over 100 pounds um and uh, that's just something that we we ask there's been an exception to the rule and i'm sure the barflies will light up the chat um to tell me which ones are i already know what they are um but yeah. our single cast prices are 85 and 90 quid uh, yeah. and yeah that's expensive but there's no doubt about it that, that is that is still expensive for a 700 mils of liquid that's between six and nine years old that's expensive um but there's only 200 plus bottles of them and they are they are rare um and they are one cask and when it's gone it's gone kind of thing and their cast strength and they're a bit of a pain in the bum to source and do and and, and all the rest of it so there is time that and extra bits and pieces along the way 
that forced the price up. Yes. But our, our drinking whiskey, we try to keep at drinking whiskey prices. Um, my, my general opinion is that, yes, whiskey is too expensive. Um, I'm a whiskey drinker. Yes, I work in this industry, but I'm still a whiskey drinker and I still... I still cringe at some of the prices on, on 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 the bloody shelf. It's honestly sometimes you look and going, well, where did they make that up from? You know. Um, yep. And it's it's hard sometimes hard to swallow. And yes, you can go. Well, I remember the time. I remember the time when I went to the co-op when I was seventeen years old or sixteen years old to buy my dad a bottle of Highland Park Twelve for fourteen quid. Yeah, I do remember that. It's just not the times that we're living in. And that, and also, yeah. and also, the Highland Park Twelve probably was more like an eighteen-year-old back then as well. Um, Overaged, yep. Yeah, so overaging is not happening anymore, you know. And pricing-wise, it's just it's gone a bit loony. But you know, I think uh, I hope that it's gonna it's gonna chill out a wee bit. I hope it's gonna it's gonna calm down. Because uh, yeah, you and I, you and I both. You need to. Well, we look, we look at it as a, a longer term thing. You know, like we, we, we want people to be. We don't want people just buying a bottle of our Demerkin because it's, it's a new distillery. I must have it, and then never because it was, eighty quid for a three year old, not coming back to us. We want people buying a bottle of our Demerkin and going. Yeah, it, it, there was distillate there. There was a bit of complexity. Um, I might revisit that because I only paid forty five quid for it. Um, and I, I might, I might go and buy one of their sherry cast releases, or I might buy their cast strength release, or there's a new rum cask out. I might give that an experiment. You know, we want people. It's all, it's all very well selling them one bottle. That any anyone can sell a inaugural bottle, one bottle. It's about keeping. Um, the interest going and people buying a second bottle and then maybe maybe if i'm dreaming maybe people just go well i've got my favorite space side i've uh, i've got my campbelltown i've got my i've got my lowland i've certainly got my isla that i uh, you know can, is there room for us to squeeze on there in our style i don't know that's the dream well my take on it and I'm going to, Gordon Fraser has said, uh, uh, never had, uh, Adam Arkin, I've never taken the piss and it's noticed and appreciated. Um, and he goes on to ask something else that I'll ask you in a second because it, it dovetails quite nicely with one of the points I'm going to bring up here. But from my perspective with you guys is that, yes, your single casks have always been that price. They've always been that price. But I was speaking to some people when I was working down at Spring Bank for the week and they were talking about how much of a pain in the backside it is to set up a bottling line for 200 bottles only to tear it apart again and then do something else and different and labels and everything. The admin of a very small outturn, small batch release makes these things a lot more expensive. And in order for it to continue to be something that's attractive to you to do as a business over your large batch vattings for your core releases and things like that, that's the price it has to be. And we accept that because your core release has been great value, as you quite rightly point out from the get-go. You didn't do an inaugural, which is why I stumbled over that word when I introduced the 09201 earlier. You didn't do it. You just came straight out with a huge turnout of 15,000 bottles at 45 quid. And you maintained that 45 quid right up until you say the duty increase recently. And now we're seeing it 48, 49 pound RRP. And you, st you can still see some deals on that, but the same on the flip side of that is you can still see some people charging 50 quid or north of it. And depending on where you are, you might have to pay a bit more. But at the distillery, at the source, they're putting it out there so that everybody should have the ability to sell it on around about that price. This is fair treatment. This is just good whiskey at a fair price. And I always remember Alex being one of those people that said, now remember, maybe it's five and six-year-old whiskey you're drinking today for your 45 quid. But next year, it's going to be seven years old. And the year after that, eight years old. And the year after that, nine years old. We're still going to be aiming to put it out at that price point, which is really reassuring to hear. I don't think there's much argument can be had with Ardnamurkin over their pricing. But generally, Colin, it's, Connell, it's frustrating for me because we're at a time that we've got more whiskey than we've ever, ever had out there in the landscape maturing and being made and produced. And what we're having is that as the older generations shuffle off and give up their drinking and 
and move away from whiskey. What we need to be doing, I think, is looking to the younger generation and saying, look, if you're into not just consuming alcohol for the sake of alcohol, but from a flavor perspective, responsible drinking, sipping, get into the story, the natural aspects of things, all the things that draws in maybe an enthusiast, the prices, there has to be stuff out there that's better than, I'm sorry, and I don't mean to be disrespectful to a bottle of Eddington's Grouse or Johnny Walker's Red Label or anything like that, but there has to be something, I think, a bit more dense and flavorful than those in order to hook people. There have to be more Ardemarkins out there. There has to be more kind of accessible price point stuff. I'm almost giving you a segue to point into something that I've actually had on the shelf in consideration for my whiskey of the year. Do you know what I'm about to mention? No. I'm going to mention something that you released earlier this year. Yeah. This thing. Now, it's not going to be up everybody's street. This is another outdoor whiskey. There's a bit of peat in there. Oh, yeah. This is quite youthful as well. But my goodness, this is 30 quid a bottle, 32 pounds, right? It's almost like the antidote. How are you able to do this? Oh, take a hit. <laughs> I don't think you're taking a hit because I know you're gaffer and I know you. And I don't think you would do it, but what I think of what you're doing, 70% malt in this and 30% grain. It's the highest malt content blend on the market. I've said that sentence quite a lot over the last six months. That, that, McLean's Nose for me has been one of the proudest things that we, we've done. And I, it might not be, it's not my favourite whiskey we've done, but it's, I'm very proud of it. And there's a reason why I'm proud of it is because we managed to, before again the duty increase, we got that in a shelf under 30 quid. Now, we are not a massive blending house. We are not a huge corporate company. Yep. We had a small team of 34 people, independently owned. And we managed to bring a whiskey to the market for under 30 quid, which was unchill filtered, natural color, 70% malt. So it can, be, it the label. can be done. It can be done. <laughs> it can be done. Well, it's what I'm saying. And there's bigger powers than, that, than us that can certainly do it. So yes, we wanted to put something out there with value, with flavor, you know, um, that can be mixed well, you know, it can go on the rocks, it can, it, it can stand up in a cocktail, but also it needs to be equally delicious to drink straight up. And that's McLean's Nose. We've just put the second batch together. It's, it's, in fact, it's going into bottle as we speak. So this will be a continual product. This is going to be available all the time, year round, and, and we will not, unless we're um, damaged by other ways in pricing, we will not be raising the, the price. It will be as, as as sharp as we can make that pencil. Um, it, and we're, we're, it's almost for us than anyone else. You know, we're, we're all whiskey drinkers uh, in the company. You know, we we want a decent uh, blend to, to, to go for. And I'm not disparaging any other blends in the market. I'm just saying we wanted a West Coast Highland style blend. Yes, it's got Arden American in there. But there's, you know, there's other bits and pieces in there too to make it a little bit interesting. And yeah, we're really chuffed with it. Really chuffed with it. I think you should be proud of it. And I'm glad to hear that you are proud of it as well. I know there's a lot of people out there saying, oh, it's 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 not nearly as good as I expected. That's because they're judging it against Ardemark and then they're judging it against other perhaps sing entry level single malts at 14, 50 quid and things. I ask them to judge it against other things at the 30 quid price band. And it's very, very tough to push it off its, its spot. Very tough especially when you sip it blind. I think it's it's just, uh, I think it's one of these things that a lot of the smaller producers, such as Adelphi, are, are capable of doing, showing bit much bigger producers that it can be done and, tell, and showing the enthusiasts the true cost of whiskey. If you can do it at the scale that you are, a lot of other producers can do it too. And to those people out there doing it on large scale, well, make a bit of wiggle room to bring up the malt content, to bring up the ABV, to make it a much more natural product. And just see, you might be surprised how much that flavor hook draws a lot more people in as well and opens that market up that you're so, so busy marketing towards with your social media of all these young faces, these trendy folk in their trendy environments drinking these whiskey from these little glasses and things like that. And all the while I look at these ads and think, these people can't afford to buy your whiskey. I don't know why you're advertising to those folk. However, let's not get distracted. Whiskey with Molly saying, as McLean's knows, a continuous co-range bottling now. Connell's just answered, Ben. Fantastic. Good to see you in Whiskey with Molly. And Julian Rickman is saying, what has not yet released cask finishes and or maturations will Connell be bringing to us in the future? 
Are you allowed to show that wee box? That's not released yet. That wee box that I got a glimpse of earlier. Can you share that? Um, Looks like a yes. Julian, I think we might get a wee scoop here. Hi. So uh, we, when we launched the, the core release uh, back in 2020, that was in the middle of an interesting time in the world, um, a time that we couldn't get on airplanes and go and launch the brand. So we, we, we did a tasting pack. Uh, at, uh, the team love uh, a pun, anything for a cheap pun, we, we will do it. Um, we called it the first AD kit or first aid kit, if you like. Perfect. Um, it was four times five CLs and it was a bit basically showing our American um, and what it can do. So we've, We've upgraded the packaging a wee bit. Um, it's still very much recyclable material, but this is your first exclusive of what this is going to be. So well, just this hold is it up and new, I'll just good our new our new gift pack. Uh, so this slides off, and then you've got four times uh, five CL um, in the pack. So you've got the core release, you've got the sherry cask release, the rum cask release. And just because we can and we fancy doing it, and we wanted feedback to be honest, um, we've got a Sautern cask. Uh, these are the, that's a single cask, the Sautern. Um, the they're all reduced to fifty percent. Um, the core is forty six point eight, um, as usual. Um, Brilliant. So yeah, that's the new the new Ardenmerkin gift pack, and it'll be probably in market next week in the UK and available for um, export very soon. So yeah, we're, we're really chuffed with it. Have you got a price for it? We're hoping to get this in the UK for around £28. Okay, so that, that's the crucial thing there is that, okay, you've got a single cask in there, that's quite high end. Uh, you've got the two mid ones there, the 50%ers, the rum cask, the sherry cask. You've got the core range in there as well. But I think that weaves quite nicely and not just Julian Rickman's question there. Thank you for sharing that and showing that tonight, Con uh, Connell. Um, it, it weaves quite nicely into that accessibility thing about price. And I remember when I was first getting into whiskey and I didn't have the money to buy all the whiskeys that I wanted to buy, smaller bottles and samples and drinks by the dram and all of these things were a great way to get your head around the landscape a wee bit. So, aye, that's interesting. I'd be very, very curious to try the Saturn. I'll look out for that. Is this a big scale release? How many packs have gone out? Initially, 2,000 packs will go out um, to the UK and then it'll be available for export after that. Okay, so UK first, then export. Julian Rickman is saying Aquavite. I'm in. Sounds delicious, says Sandro. Good to see you in, Sandro. Is that the Sandro that you met in Milan? Yeah, Sandro, yeah, we met, uh, Antonio and I uh, met him uh, on the, was it the Monday night or the Sunday night? I think it might have been the Monday night. I think it was the Monday. You um, sent me a message on the Monday. And, yeah, de delightful, delightful chap. He, he came over um, originally from Canada, but he's, he lives in Milan and, and, and London as well. And, uh, yeah, a bar fly. I met, I met a lot of bar flies um, in, in, in Milan and we have also in, in Taiwan as well. <laughs> I, I caught up with Jeff Whiskey. <laughs> In uh, in Taiwan, which was hilarious. A uh, good guy, Jeff. Good guy from from G Whiskey. He's got his own YouTube channel, of course, and things. Yeah, I'm right. not sure if he would refer to himself as a bar fly, maybe. Um, but uh, I was good to see you hook up with, with him as well. It's just amazing how, and it's it's through people doing that traveling like yourself that can help shrink that world a little bit and kind of tie it together. And you're always good about taking photos and things like that and sharing it, Connell. It's good stuff. Hell's with the saying. Uh, Connell, will there be much batch variation in the McLean's nose? I think it's inevitable, right? I think, yeah. Uh, I, will, I would like to think there won't be much in the initial stages because we've certainly got enough of the other components for a few, for a good few batches ahead, i.e. the grain, the other malt, um, and it's all very consistent along with with the, the West Highland malt um, together, I think that there will be few and far between, hopefully. Well, I say hopefully. It doesn't. I think it will be the same. It will be hopefully better. We're actually keeping a Solera going as well. So we always blend a little bit more than just 25,000 bottles. And nice. Anything that we don't use, we put into refill sherry butts. Um, so that's holding a bit of a Solera. Um, so that will continue. We do that for the... 
the the core release as the well. Release, yeah. So there's always that little bit of um, carry forward that yep. consistency that's that's a top up to base from. So yeah, we're doing that with McLean's nose. So yeah, I think you'll there will be batch variation. Of course there will be, but um, it will also be the same style. So that's for sure. That's and one you're of the obviously going to be aiming for that minimum ceiling of or a minimum baseline of quality. Yeah. Oh no, no. I, I mean, if anything, I, I hope it gets better. Um, hopefully it does. But that's the reason why we don't disclose the grain um, because we don't have a guaranteed consistent supply. We've got enough to keep us going for a few years, um, but there is a chance that we might not be able to continue with it. And if that does happen, we need to look for more and. You know that's why we don't. That's why we don't disclose the grade component. Got you. Makes sense. Makes perfect sense. Jimmy, like you saying, Agraviti, it must feel good to be welcomed all around the world. You deserve it. I think you deserve it as well, Connell. Thanks very much, and thanks, Jimmy, for the kind words. And Graham Fraser is saying, does Connell have any involvement in Adelphi choices too? As he mentioned earlier, Graham, that is part, very much part of your remit, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, again, um, one of my favourite parts of my job is cask selection for Adelphi. Uh, I'm 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 not solely doing this. Uh, I, I work alongside Alex and the team, uh, so it's, it's all a team effort. Everything that we do is a team effort. Uh, so, but yes, I, I'm very lucky to work with some some very cool casks, and that's a nice segue to say that we are Adelphi celebrated 30 years this year as an independent bottler. So. I meant, awesome. to th- I meant to say congratulations. Thank you, thank you. And while yeah. I'm on the while I'm on the path of congratulations, congratulations on the success in this year's online Scotch Whiskey Awards again, oh. amazing. Unfortunately, next year you have to go and play, as Alex says, in the big boys' playground next year. But the congratulations don't stop because at the Icons Awards in real time you're having success. You've won the best sales team of the year. Uh, the best visitor experience at Ardamurkin of the year, the best sustainable distillery, the best craft distillery, and then the best uh, noise statement blend, McLean's Nose has picked up an award. This is happening tonight. This was happening all just before I came online. It was my, my phone was erupting. My WhatsApp's going crazy. Um, so yes, uh, it's been a it's been a it's been a lovely evening uh, for, for us in that regard. So, Jenny, well, Jenny, Jenny, and Carl were receiving the the plaudits this evening. So yeah, we're all we're all very chuffed. In order to celebrate that, then Connell, I am pouring what I believe is a decent fit is the decadent pour. So let's bring up for a decadent pour. We're we're speaking something that's quite self indulgent. Something that you're just going to be sitting potentially on your own or a quiet night, a sofa pour that you just want to sit and purr like a whiskey-filled kitten all night. Something that you're really spoiling yourself with. I've grabbed your one of your products. I've grabbed your sherry cask. Um, the camera doesn't even want to focus because it sees Santa. So it's, it's, but you know what it looks like, and I think most of the folk out there knows what it looks like. You can, can get a wee miniature of that in that pack you just showed there. 50% ABV, um, another wee terrific take on Ardenham. No, my favourite style of whiskey, no, my favourite Ardenham Urchin, but something that has, I think, Fitz has been quite decadent. But this is about you tonight, buddy. What have you got in the glass to celebrate all your awards and achievements over the year? Well, I've not I've not gone brand, but I've, I've I kind of regret this now because I, I'm giving too much attention to uh, a Campbelltonian story, which I, sh- I didn't mean to do, but I've committed now. Hey, if if you you have to tell, yeah, that's why you're here. If this is what you're drinking, if this is what you're loving, so you've grabbed a cage bottle from Warehouse Six. Uh, it's a 10-year-old Springbank Fresh Sherry, 60, 56, sorry, 0.8% ABV. Uh, it's got your name written on it as well. You have to stand in the same queue as everybody else to get this. Terrific, terrific stuff. And it's being cracked in front of us. There we are. If anybody bumps into me at the Bon Accord over the next few weeks over Christmas, we'll be able to enjoy a very, very similar bottle to this. Uh, together, I've got a bottle of this at the Bon Accord open as well. What a nice noise that is to get that. And I have to say, Connell, I know that it is maybe your second pick from Campbelltown, but that's okay. This is a very decadent pour. That's, that, I don't know. that's what I would pour. If, if someone wanted decadence, that's what I would pour. Um, yeah. 
or I'd pour something really heavily sherried or something like that from Speyside. But yeah, um, yeah. What do you think of this idea that Springbank is just overhyped now? Because you're starting to suffer from that a wee bit yourself. A lot of people that are in the enthusiast circle specifically are starting to believe that uh, I actually uh, I'd heard through second hand. I didn't. It wasn't face to face. It would have been an interesting discussion. It was face to face. But I had somebody who clearly un doesn't understand business or how I operate or whatever. But I had somebody suggest that I was on retainer from Arden Market because of how much I get behind what you guys are doing there. Like what you're doing with your Springbank examples right now. If you love something, you can't hide it. If you believe in something, you have to share it. I think that the reason that I like to talk about Arden Amarkin is because in a lot of respects, you guys, despite only being on the go for about nine years, maybe not even nine yet, you're already torchbearers. You're already leading the way in a lot of respects. I think that that deserves to be talked about. There is no mechanism in place for you to in any way sponsor me. That's not true. Connell, if you wanted to step forward and become a patron of mine, you would. You could. It, it would make no difference to what I say about Arda Merkin, believe me, buddy. So, you know, it's just, but there is no mechanism in place for sponsorship, for retainers, for, for all of this nonsense, right? Just the same way that you're holding up your spring bank there and feeling a wee tinge of guilt. But you these are the things that you want to indulge in and i think that that's important to share yeah i, I remember my, my gut feeling um when i saw it because I was, I was i was saving this this whiskey for a decadent time at christmas and uh and that's kind of what i uh that's why i chose it but yeah look no no apologies i mean if i i bought that at the warehouse well did it spring back when i was there not that long ago and um yeah it's uh i don't think Springbank is overhyped. I think that's some, I think that's a lot a load of tripe, if I'm honest. I think people are just bitter because they can't buy it. And I can understand the bitterness. Um but I think you can't put a company down that does everything the way they do it. Yeah. Because they're not going to mass produce and make it available. That's the whole reason why Springbank's special. So yeah, I'm I, I'm uh, yeah, for me they are they are what scotch whiskey is all about i mean they're they do everything on site we all know this i'm not i'm not going to go over this but we do you take any inspiration from springbank oh of course i do i i love the team uh they're, they're very good friends of mine i was just with uh with cameron from cabin heads in milan i haven't seen him in ages you know dave ronald um you know Fiona, Jenna, the whole team out, out in Campbelltown, I'm, I'm very close to and consider them friends. But yeah, not only that, I think their whiskey's fantastic. Not not just Springbank. I think Kilkerran's fantastic. I think Hazelburn's fantastic. I think Long Row's fantastic. I think Cadenheads is an amazing independent bottler. Um, and yeah, it's I'm 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 a fanboy of the facility. There's no doubt about it. Um, what we're talking about is not hype. What we're talking about is consensus. Yes. And yes, they are a victim of that model, that success, but they deserve the success from that model. They really, really do. And I think that the more distilleries that kind of take some some leaves, leaves out of the Springbank book, I think are going to be held in high regard in the future too. It doesn't come easy. There was a time that Springbank couldn't sell its product. There was a time that it had to close its doors. Absolutely. And, and people forget that. And that wasn't that long ago. It really wasn't. There are people down there in Campbelltown right now that remember that times. So when they, when you ask them at the distillery, what about these crazy times? Is it not nuts to see people queuing up in the morning and things? I remember being told we'd rather have it like that than what it used to be. It's very vivid in a lot of memories down there. There's payoff comes from doing things the right way, but it's very rarely a fast payoff. They need to grind it out. And now that they've done that, I think it's lazy to suggest that it's hype. Hype is when something is artificially inflated, right? To to oversell, to over exaggerate things. And I don't think that that's what's happening. And I think, honestly speaking, the way things are going up at Ardemarkin as well, that's why it's easy to have you on, let's be honest. The reason it's ha easy to have candid discussions with you, Connell, is because I, I believe in all of these things. 
I'm not drinking the Kool-Aid. I've literally been there. I've walked the ground. I've touched everything and I've seen it from all aspects. And then I've seen it from the enthusiast side as well. I encourage everybody to go up and see it out working as they can, but so many people can't, so they have to enjoy it through the what through the liquid, through the stuff that's coming out of there. Oh look, I totally get it. Um, you know, we didn't exactly put it in a convenient place. <laughs> um, but uh people who do come to visit us hopefully um are rewarded with uh with an experience, a warm Highland welcome, um, a good tour. The team are great there. Um and hopefully a choice of good bottlings, both from Adelphia and Arden American. And yeah, you know, we, 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 and we try to stay open as, as, as much throughout the year as we can. Aye, you do. You do. Uh, Anthony Lambert's in saying, is there anywhere online I could buy the Arden American merch here in Germany? I'd love to fly the flag here for such a great dram. What I'd suggest to you, uh, Anthony, is that we all bully Connell in order to bully his distributor so that when he comes to Limburg in April next year, he cannot just be have, offering all the Ardemarkin whiskies, but a bunch of Ardemarkin merch. You can, well. you can certainly buy merch on our website. It's, you can buy merch, just not alcohol. So, yes. Um, not alcohol and not glasses, apparently. You can you can probably order the glasses, but I wouldn't suggest it because they'll, they'll get smashed. They'll get smashed. <laughs> let's let's stop and please let Connell tell us about that Springbank fresh sherry, and he's got a wee a, a wee slabbery emoji there. Uh, you have a think about that, Connell, and I'll read out. Keith McDonald said, "I'd love to know what Speyside and Isla Connell would reach for, since we know his other regions." Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll bring up the other uh, categories, but there's something I want to ask him as he tells us about the fresh sherry. Go ahead. Is it good? Ah, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, there you go. Oh, Phil oh, Connell oh, McKenzie oh. taste to know it's Justin. <laughs> no, it's great. It's great. It's um, it's not even that hot. I mean, it's coming at a 56.8. It's not even tasting like that. I know I've had, I've had a few drums already tonight, but it's not, um, it's not jumping out of the glass. And yes, it's a neck pour, but it's 10 years in fresh sherry right yeah it's yeah but it's not even over it's not even that overcooked it might look it might look overcooked but it's not it's not but, that spring bank's got a dense robust enough spirit to to hold that is what it does so well right it's just there. yeah it handles sherry extremely well yeah. no it's just beautiful it's 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 got that it has it's got that typical forest floor earth floor dunnage dank thing that they they managed to do i don't know I wonder. Do it. I, wish I wonder, I wonder, Conor McKenzie, how much of that flavour, that density, that quality of spirit comes from in-house floor maltings and bottling and reducing its source. So you know what questions I'm going <laughs> to hit you with now. Floor malting and the peninsula, maybe potentially bottling its source or somehow maybe reducing with that local magical water that you have up there. What's the... What's the possibilities? It's tough for you because you've got a legacy established bottling hall in the east, haven't you? Yeah, we do. So Adelphi's uh, bottling house uh, head head office is is in Fife, um, and that's where we get all our barley from. Well, 70 percent of our barley now. We we can, well, you can't grow barley in Arden American even if you wanted to. Uh, we floor malting, funnily enough, is a uh, heavily uh, top. Uh, conversational piece just now between Alex and I we are we have a malt floor and a lot of people don't know that it's already there it's in place it's there we have a kiln it's all there the pagoda roof's there it's all ready to go we just need to basically put a perforated floor in we some, we just need to get that commissioned and an elevator floor basically to take the barley up and a method of steeping so we need to either install a steep tank to steep the barley in water for germination uh, or we simply just use an outdoor vessel to steep it in and then take the barley up wet onto the floor. Um, and then we can malt it. So floor malting, 100% is going to go ahead. We, we, I mean, we're 75% there. We just need to get it all signed off. Um, bottling at source won't, won't be done. No. Um, that's... A logistical nightmare i mean you've been to arden american yeah we try and limit i mean uh, the the cast deliveries alone are, are are quite vast so we don't want to add any more traffic to that single track peninsula road so 
you know, we, and logistic wise, that's a lot of different trucks picking up from one source. It makes absolutely no sense um, to, to do that. We can I, can I testify to this? Go on. Those two casks that we sampled in summer and vent been finally selected to bottle. Mm -hmm. I saw them in the little hogsheads. You know, they're all little, but I feel like I could have rolled one and got it into the boot of my car. That's the scale that we're talking about. Okay. When I went to see it over in Pentland in the warehouse at, at Raw Mill Whiskey's warehouse to take the first two samples off the pallets, I saw the pallets stacked high, two pallets that I could not have got either one of them anywhere close to fitting in the boot of my car. Sure. These were huge pallets up to here, right? That is when you bottle a hogshead and put it on a, in bottles and a pallet, that's what you're dealing with. So this isn't, I, I, I've seen that for myself. I can understand the scale of shipping a cask of whiskey versus bottling it and then shipping it. It would, there would be a hell of a lot more truck miles, I guess. Yeah, I, I think, and, and, and just think about export. I mean, every export market has a different shipping contractor. So, you know, you could deal with Hillebrand or you could deal with Mammoth or you could deal with Albatrans. And they're coming all the way out to the furthest western point in the British mainland to pick all up all the trucks, all the to trucks. Pick up a pallet to pick up a container to pick up a. We just can't do that. There's no way we can do that. So, um, well, central sense. distribution. Just take. No, I'm not. I'm not pushing for it. You've answered. Sorry. No, I just. I just. But, but, but why? Why? I mean, what what difference does that make? I mean, I'm, the, the reason why I'm asking you this is because. We have a theory, and we've talked about this before, is that when we come off still at 69 to 70%, and we are reduced to 63.5. Locally. Locally, with the water from the hill, the yes. juicy water that we use in Arden American. So Arden American has got that mineralic salinity that we all, I think we can all agree that it's got a salinity to the, to, to, to the spirit. Yep. We then take those casks down and reduce to 46.8%, let's say. That is with demineralized water. So from the six, from the say 58% natural strength down to 46.8, that's with demon water. Yep. So yeah, it would be a really cool experiment, and we will do it because I'm talking about it now and we need to do it just because <laughs> to prove to prove a point. <laughs> Would, a point. And, and, and the question is, would a cask from reduced to 63.5 and then matured on site for, let's just say, seven years and then reduced a further however many percent, 12 percent back to 46 with the same water, would that be even more salty? I mean, what would it be like? I don't know. All I'm saying is that it seems to be we still have very much a coastal salinity to our whiskey. And that's with just reducing it it's still to 63.5. So we're fairly happy with the way it is. However, we should, under due diligence, and just for sheer shits and giggles, just do it to see it uh, fully reduced with Arden American water. I agree. Even if it only if it proves that there's really so little benefit in it that we've tried it and there's really, it's not where the model is, is perfectly fine. But if it yeah. does actually somehow amplify your spirit or something, there are ways around it, I suppose, that does cut down on the truck count. I mean, you could literally- Well, we could vat them together. a lot of really tired wood yeah. with water. We could vat together if we had a big enough, a big enough um, vatting tank and then put it tank in the IBCs it. or whatever it may be and yeah. But I mean, if if our operations director Gordon was on the stream right now, he would be he'd be Livid. cursing he'd be <laughs> cursing my name. No, I, I think you've answered that in a very and you've answered it in a way that vet, that placates me and placates potentially the the folk that are watching from the lounge as well. Chris Barlow's bought us a wee dram from Australia. You star Chris, he's saying a brilliant visitor experience at Ardmore and a truly passionate and dedicated team. Connell and the crew deserve all the accolades coming their way. Cheers from Australia, Chris. Uh, the Icon Awards this very ve this very evening backs you up on that. They've just picked up the Icon Awards for Distiller Experience. One of my friends from Holland, Daniel Williams, 
came over during the, the weekend of the Glasgow Festival and didn't have a great time visiting the distillery, but there was literally none of the team there because Glasgow dis the w distillery weekend, spirits in the sky is on, and uh, there's so many things on that weekend that I think it, the team was spread so, so thinly. Um, but I think, in my experience, every time I've visited, and most every barfly that visits and comes back is absolutely wooed and falls in love uh, with a visit up the up to the peninsula. And Big Ed has bought us a dram. Uh, no comment or anything, Big Ed. I'm I'm scrolling down a wee bit just to see if you've mentioned anything, but just to buy us a wee dram from the states. Big Ed, thank you for your dram, my friend. Very generous of you. And Chris Barlow too. Thanks for the kind words for Connell and the team. Cheers. Okay. Pals Graff is saying it might also well reduce quality, otherwise transport the water and tanks to Adelphi bottling. Well, Pals Graff, Graff, my friend, we've already got some commitment from Connell at some point in the future, and I know that they are playful and they like to experiment, so uh, I would be uh, looking forward to those guys uh, uh, bringing us something in the future to say, here's A and B, tell us which one was reduced at the distillery, and tell us, you could do one of your retasting kits blind, right? You could just tell us what's in the bottles. Exactly, specify exactly what it is, but in the bottles themselves, be a little bit more careful how you how you uh, labelled it, so we wouldn't know which water was in one and would leave it to the community. Anyway, uh, enough on that. Listen, buddy, we've got two more before we get to the quiz. Can't believe I'm not getting through this tonight. So let's ask for two at the same time, okay? First up, when well, I don't want to rush you, but I'd realise that there's lots of things that we still want to to talk about, and we want you to participate in this quiz at the end. I'm in the no rush. You can't... You're fine. You're not doing. You're not doing a quiz. What was that? I said I'm in no rush. You're fine. Good, good. <laughs> I thought I was going to get a parachute in the quiz. They are good. Category four is the VIP pour. VIP pour, just to frame it, is that if somebody has come to the house, somebody who may or may not be into whiskey, but certainly they're a whiskey drinker. And it's something that you really want to give them to show them that you consider them a VIP and you want to treat them to something. And of course, category five is completely different altogether. This is the attention grabber. What we're trying to do here is even if you've got a room full of whiskey geeks, what we're looking for is a really potent, powerful hook, something that really, really grabs the attention almost making it difficult to have normal conversation because of what you're sipping in the glass. Let's have the VIP pour up first, Connell. What, do, what would you be grabbing? VIP pour would be probably something from like... Ooh, 31 years old, Highland Grain Distillery from North Star. We were hosting yeah, yeah. a whiskey club on Monday night by Ian from North Star, a great night. Um, he did bring along a couple of special drums. That was not one of them. I wonder, did I have that? Yeah, so, I mean, it's just something, for, probably something from an IB, you know, um, not necessarily a Delphi, but uh, from something from the Thompson Brothers or North Star or James E.D. or, you know, something like that, something that's, you know, Single cask, probably. I think that's quite commendable. Right, so what you're talking, you've just given all your competitors, or a fair chunk of your competitors, a shout out there. Remember earlier on in tonight from the lounge, we had a comment coming in, uh, talking about how someone, I forget who it was, and apologies, they've seen, I think it was Graham Fraser, had seen quite a few six-year-old Arda Merkins being bottled by what's ostensibly your competitors, North Star Spirits. Um, what was the other one more recently? Little Brown Dog. Other independent bottlers getting a hold of your liquid and selling it. What's the deal there? I know there's symbiosis in Scotch whiskey, but that's taken it a step further, right? Yeah, I think... That's a bit like Gordon McPhail giving you Ben Romack. Yeah, wouldn't that be lovely? Um, the I think Ben Romack is fantastic. I think... Um, Me too. We... We began our, our whiskey journey in our modern history, if you will, uh, Adelphi in 1993. So we, we, came, we, we came from an independent bottler. I mean, that's that has been our history. Alex took over in 2004. Um, and in 2008, quickly saw that, you know, casks, but even then were starting to become 
they were starting to not become as accessible and and then put the plans in place for for Arden American sort of then and we built it in 2012 2013 so when our whiskey came of age we didn't people started approaching us um and we it was a no-brainer we we imagine the hypocrisy if we, we we've managed to get to where we are today as an ib and then not sell to ibs i mean that's a pretty dick move and uh we're just not up for that the only stipulation that we have when, when it's possible um and it's been the success rate's been pretty good is that we invite we ask um our partners that we're going to work with to simply visit make the pilgrimage do the miles take a flight whatever it may, whatever it may be come to the west come out to Arden American and let's not do this whole I'll send you a sample and then you can taste it and tell me if you like it or not god I can testify to this <laughs> it's the most unromantic thing you've ever seen come yeah. out see the area drive the road spend an hour three hours in a warehouse you know drink it like without being cheesy genuinely get in there get in amongst it open casks and select the casks for yourself and 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 you know obviously retire and have a few drams and a a, a couple of beers with with the team and it's more of a social thing in that regard you know um and and more times than not the people that we deal with whether it's the thompson brothers or Angus McRaeld or you know um Cabin Heads or whoever it may be they're absolutely game for that because they you know it's important I think it's important and I think there's too much too much of this can you send a sample and sometimes you don't even get a sample <laughs> so I'm asking for the next level I'm asking you to come to the furthest western point in 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 in, in, in the UK to, to 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 buy your cask but i don't do it in that way i obviously say look come out and have an evening with us and catch up because a lot of these people are our friends or, or certainly acquaintances so yeah that that's for me that's that's a hugely important part of it here here I have to say, Carl, you're true to your word. I can testify to everything that you say is absolutely spot on and true. And I've heard those exact same words and sentiments from your gaffer as well. Uh, the hypocrisy thing is real. If you're making whiskey and you refuse to sell that whiskey to other independent bottlers after making a living out of independent bottling your whole life, I mean, I don't know if if hypocrisy is the is the right word, but it is not inappropriate to use it, I think. I think there's a lot to be said for how strong the Scotch whiskey industry is, is a value proposition to everybody involved because of how symbiotic it is and how the more that you behave like you're the only distillery or the only whiskey or the only independent bottler in town, the more you're, I think you're going to struggle to get people on board with just how fantastic a thing whiskey is. And I know that you guys all get that. Chris Barlow has bought us a dram. A brilliant visitor experience at Arden working on a truly passionate and dedicated team. I, I think I picked that up, surely. Connell and the crew deserve the accolades coming their ratios from Australia. I did get it. Chris, eh, thank you very much. That's, that's You get two for the price of one there, buddy. Daniel Williams is saying no hard feelings here at the tour about the tour this is daniel that i just spoke about there connell and he's saying hey, we'll just have to go back again someday uh a ps i hope st nick treats you well mm -hmm. hey, i forgot about the 5th of december daniel uh, center klaus day daniel sent us a care package for me to open with the kids and i said no we're going to do this the right way for center class we're going to open it on the 5th and my son came to me and said dad we we've not opened that box that was tonight so I, I said, okay, we've missed it. I'll, we'll do it on this weekend. Daniel, I'll feed back to you and let you know how we got on with it. Graham Young has uh, bought me a dram to say, a trail to Adam Arkin uh, might have been one of the best days as an impressionable whiskey evangelist. To put away a cask for future memories was an equal ethereal experience. This is from Graham Young, who came up with Peter Lee and Gino last year, or earlier this year, perhaps. No, it was a year ago. Peter told us it was a year ago, and, and Graham's bought us a dram from Canada as well. Fantastic. Justin Wan also is saying, what's the dynamic between competitors in whiskey, especially between smaller scale distilleries and indie bottlers? Justin, I hope that we've just been able to touch upon that there. Um, it's amazing how much they do actually rely and lean on each other. 
uh, it's just down to I think a lot of individuals involved will maybe let Connell answer that. And Rolfi Ebhead has brought us a very generous strand to say, always great to meet Connell. It's a small world. Seems to but I seem to bump into him quite often. This year's Springbank Open Day, I met Connell putting uh, pouring from behind a very busy bar. He said he wanted to help Springbank out on his day off. Shows his class. Uh, Rolfi, uh, Justin Wan, Graham Young, Daniel Williams, Big Ed, and Chris Barlow, who I've already mentioned. Uh, thank you for your drums. Thank you. Some kind words there. Are, are you all competitors, Colin? Uh, Connell? I suppose on the, on the face of it, we are. Um, but I think, you know, it's never it's never sort of seen like that. I think, you know, someone said to me a while ago, you after a big conference, you probably wouldn't see BMW, Mercedes and Volkswagen going out for tea together after the conference or the big car show. It's very much the opposite in the whiskey industry. Um, we're all yep. happy to share, share. We're happy to share info, um, what we're doing, what we're up to, what's working, what markets are good, what markets aren't great, what markets we might be struggling with, what releases are doing well, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think you know we're, we're we are a quite a tight knit industry. Uh, it's a lovely environment to be in, I must say, and uh, yeah, it's 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 very it's a very unusual environment um considering that technically we are all competing but we're really do you know do you know sometimes i feel you know, sometimes i feel that what it is is just humility um and 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 a love for the product and the that idea that brand scotch is bigger than any individual spot brand bottling distillery whiskey whatever it may be that 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 feeling that sense that that a uh, rising tide could potentially lift all boats and that, that kind of thing. And it's not a new thing. It's been happening in whiskey for years and years and years and years. But I think it gets to, when it gets to large scale competing for retail shelf space and duty-free space and and attention and, and whatever it may be, when it gets labels slapped on it and brands slapped on it and logos slapped on it, it can sometimes people that are far removed from what whiskey, how visceral whiskey actually is, I think, the way that you operate, I think, helps to reduce that, to bring people in, to ask them to come and feel it and see it and touch it. That kind of idea, I think it all helps to teach people a wee bit about that. But more than anything, as I say, the humility of just knowing that you can learn something from everybody that you meet in whiskey, regardless of what they are or what they do. Um, yeah. yeah. A wee drama in from Darth Kermit as well, saying thanks, Roy. Hey, Justin, and I'll catch up on replay. Uh, nice to have you in, buddy. It's good, always good to welcome you here. Right, one more to go, Connell, the attention grabber. The VIP pour. We've had that one for, from you. Another good one. Oh, pretty decent uh, uh, whiskies tonight. A uh, uh, 31-year-old, well-aged grain. But what? Are we, what how are we going to uh, It's the end of the night. You know, people, are palates are starting to get a wee bit tired of their fifth drama, drama in, and you're going to give something that's just going to wake everyone up again. Go on, Brand. Go on, because I'm going to go on, Brand. I'm only I'm only showing this because I, I, I got the I got a dribble of it from our uh, Adelphi 30th um, anniversary dinner that we had. But I'll, I'll show you. I'll show you this. Oh, it's a belter. It's an Adelphi. The camera's not going to focus on it for it to tell us, but I can see from the black label. Tell us about it. It's called the whiskey that cannot be named. <laughs> of course. Uh, it's, a, it's a 1953 single cask. Oh, my goodness. Bottled in 2003 from a very well-known distillery in Speyside. Oh, my goodness. Inverness is only five hours from me. Keep the lights on, won't you? <laughs> I'll save you a drum, mate. <laughs> oh my goodness! But I mean, I was, I was originally without. I don't want to show off, but I've only got a wee bit left in the bottle. But I was going to show you a wee cask sample of. Uh, and again, this will be an exclusive uh, on the V Pub tonight. But it's going to be news as of tomorrow because we're going to announce a new Adelphi list tomorrow. But there is a '96 Imperial coming out from Adelphi. '96 um, Imperial. Aye. Now, there's less and less of it coming out. I remember the days, 95, 96 Imperial, we could pick it up for 150, 175 quid. It's going for a hell of a lot more than that these days, of course. Uh, it's, 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 unfortunately, it's a nudge north of that, I'm afraid. But uh... Absolutely, I don't doubt it. Uh, Imperial will never be brought back to life. It'll never be made again. 
well, that's not true. There's another distillery on the site. Dalmurich right. is now making Mister uh, Imperial. Um, but yeah, that that 1953. Are you kidding? 1953. 50 years um, old. But I, I cast sample of the Imperial. I sorry, I just have distracted there. Is is that what you're sipping? Is the 53 right? That is yeah. Yeah, that's just nuts. Incredible. Um, so yes, uh, Imperial, it's running out. There's not a lot of it left. Um, it's getting more and more scarce, the more and more bottlings that come out of it. Either of those, I think, would be attention grabbers. I'm going to go for something that's a lot more, let's say, uh, affordable and available. And I think it is an attention grabber. Uh, this is actually my favourite of the releases so far. I, I am three of these in. And this is my second bottle of my favourite, but this is one of yours. Ah, the cask strength. This is your most heavily peated. Uh, and, and I have to say that if you're thinking of Isla Peat, it's not there, but it's up there. It's the most heavily peated, I believe, except for perhaps a single cask, core range from the Ardemarkin series. Um, different ABVs, uh, ABVs each, each batch. This is the O222, which I think was the first one. 58.7% ABV. I went back and got a second bottle of this because, again, it's the most, the driest, uh, the most kind of spirit forward, uh, the most light of cask, I think, out of the three that we've had so far. But that's not to take anything away from 2022 second release, excuse me, or the 2023 release. And this is going to be an annual release from you now as well, isn't it, Connell? Yeah, it is. And uh, most people know it's my favourite. So the 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 cast, the cast strength for me is is my sort of favourite style of Arden American. It's mainly bourbon cask and it's mainly peated. Our peating levels are 30 ppm. Um, we are doing higher. Um, we've started doing heavily peated stuff, but that's not going to be available for for a wee while yet. But uh, yeah, for me, this is it's an it's a different level of a mineralic salinity. The alcohol obviously brings big texture, but works incredibly well straight up in the wine cairn, but also really works really well with a highball. And and if you 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 ask what the what does the industry drink, I started tonight off with a <laughs> with a highball so there you are you've confessed this to me in the past before that you're you have a wee bit of a highball fetish i do too i do enjoy it however and roddy's keen on this too you know roddy of course but roddy's always kind of he, he loves to play with eyeballs and, and he's always talked about certain pt whiskeys being good i've not tried this in the highball maybe i should over the course of this weekend maybe i'll try a cast strength art the Merkin highball i tend not to go for for pt ones to do it but this is just a, an incredible. We're of course, you're, of course, this is your favourite Connell. We're whiskey enthusiasts. At your core range, there's a good chance you're going to pick the cast strength, right? I think in the future, if this is an annual release, I think let's compare it to Springbank. Your your local barley is your Paul Lanois. This is going to be, this cast strength release is going to be your 12-year-old cast strength like it is from Springbank. And what I want to say to you is that you're following in similar steps to Springbank in that regard as well with not taking the Mickey on price. The price is almost the same as the cast strength from Springbank. They've got 12-year-old product to put in it. You're not there yet. I'm sure when you get there, you still won't take the Mickey on price. I think the Paul Lanois is probably one of your most expensive releases. But it's still the one that, despite me chasing it, I've never been able to catch one yet. I've tasted it, and it's absolutely gorgeous liquid. This, I need you to explain to me how salt gets into whiskey. This is salty whiskey. We just sent uh, DJ Jenny, Graham, and Tony up with uh, some Malden sea flakes, and we just open each bung and just sprinkle a little bit in. As we go along, <laughs> you put the salt in. <laughs> yes, that's it. That uh, explains it. It's a very labour-intensive process. I mean, it is. I've got no idea. If I knew that, I would write a recipe for it. Let me ask a different question. You said salinity, but do you taste salt in this whiskey? Yes. Salty. It is salty. It's objectively salty. I'm not saying there's salt in it. But just in the way there isn't pineapples in this, or there isn't there isn't 
ash in this, all of these things I taste. I taste salt in this whiskey. I genuinely think that's one of the saltiest whiskies um, on, on the market. And I, yes. I, I, I would hang my hat on that. And I, I would, I know pe people talk about Paltney being salty or Oban having a saltiness and, 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 and obviously some Islas have saltiness to it as well. But I genuinely think that's, that is up there with one of the saltiest um, whiskies that, that, that is in Scotland. I, and I don't know where it comes from. It's more annoying that I don't know where it comes from, but uh, I, I like that we've got it. <laughs> yeah, and it's almost like, you know, we spend a lot of time trying to scientifically explain away why something is what it is. When the, the real argument is, look, just the same as you, if you say you taste leather or polish or, or wood, or, it doesn't matter, whatever it is, rather than trying to explain how it gets in there, just enjoy the fact that it can stimulate your your olfactory system in that way in order for you to, your brain to say salt. It's just, it's wonderful. And I agree with you that this is, to, to my perspective, uh, Talisker hasn't disappeared for, for us. It's not gone away. We can still get it. It's still out there. But it's a lot more expensive than it used to be, especially if we want higher age statement, if we want the nicer stuff. 10-year-old is still in our reach. This is showing Talisker what they might have missed in certain years over recent years. This is every bit that West Coast briny maritime mineralic salinity and such a dense, potent, powerful little package. I think I paid 65 quid for this, Connell. Would that be right? Uh, yeah, 60 or 65. I think it went up to 65 with the new duty. So just thank you. And I know because you've said it, and I know that Alex has said it, with it, all other things being equal, everything within your control, of course, the intention is to keep the cast strength at that price point and that price band and going forward as well. Yeah. You're going to just, you're going to blow the doors off. It's just going to get better. If people are tired of hearing me talking about how good Ardham Arkin is in 2023, you continue along this path, you're going to get really sick of me talking about it in the future. But I know I talk about it not being hype, like in the case of Springbank, it's consensus. And I know I'm not the only one. Yes, Deshai has bought us a drama to work in Springbank. And even my beloved Ben Romack gets a mention, thoroughly enjoying my first VPUB live in a long time. Cheers, Roy and Connell. Yash, it's wonderful to see your name back again, my friend. And it's wonderful to welcome your wee pink barfly. Uh, terrific stuff. Herben from the Netherlands. I think it's from the Netherlands, buddy. He's bought me a drama in Euros. Herben, I think, is a Dutch name. I don't know. Here's another category. What would you two pour each other? Herben, thank you for your drama. Yes, yeah. yes, I thank you for your drama, guys. Cheers. I read an interview from you before I came up to the distillery, Connell, and I made a mistake and I didn't bring the drama up to you. But when I was speaking to you, I realized I didn't need to bring the drama up to you because you told me a story about how you'd overcome that obstacle. You were asked a question in that interview a long time ago. Don't even remember where it's from, but it's rattling around in my head. What's your unicorn drama? What's your go-to? What's the thing that you want more than anything? And you said, you know what? I've only ever had one Brora in my life and it blew my socks off. I'd love to try more Brora. And I've got a Brora here. When I read that, I said, when I go up to the peninsula, I'll take some Brora with me. And I bloody forgot. But then you told me that you'd been welcomed at Brora. You've done it. You've managed to get some Brora down your face. You managed to, so I felt okay about it. Um, but there you go. I think if you were here, buddy, I would pour you a wee glass of that Brora. I'd pour myself one as, as well if that would, if that's okay, right? Yeah, what would you what, what would you pour for me? I'm sitting in that comfy spot in that kind of, that, that, the accommodation that you've built next to the distillery with the wee kitchen along to the side. What are you pouring for me? Oh. Recently, I'd probably pour you this. Just watch, watch, watch the salesman work here, you see. Another wee exclusive on the VPUB, a, a first world exclusive on the new Adelphi label. The third one tonight. Oh, no, you're talking. 12 years old. I'd pour you a re... I think this is... No, it's first fill. First fill bourbon. 
Adelphi claim leash. I'm it's still, only, I'm still on old, board. But it is absolutely claim leash personified. And that's the that's the wee tweet to the Adelphi label. The dancing man now features on the on the label. And that's that's what I would pour you. I'll give you 120 quid for it. How much you how much is it going for? Oh you'll 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 have change if you if you want if you want it. That's my Christmas. That's my Christmas. You'll have change. Harder you'll to get now, isn't it? 120 quid for that. Good. Well, the Azure are charging. Sorry, I, I know we, we we don't want to. It's not the the VPUB for that tonight, but they're charging 175 quid for their uh, first fill or or their bourbon cask special releases Klein Leash. <sighs> the less we say about that, the better, I think. Mm. Scott's Brora at Legfest, Sublime says Hillswood, amazing. Jimmy Leg, I, I am a little sick of it. Says Aquaviti, <laughs> he's sick about me me talking about Arden Arkin so much. I think it's hard for Jimmy in Nova Scotia as well, especially when he kind of get his hands on. We do it. send it to Nova Scotia. You do? Mm -hmm. They don't take it off a lot, but we do send it. Probably just the core range though, right? Yeah, just the core. The, uh, the core just now. Um, but they, they, they sort of place an order every four to six weeks, but it's just, it's obviously a consolidation just constantly leaving. Um, but it's not a lot. Listen to this. Jimmy Legg is pointing out, Tyree Kai. Explained why you taste saltiness on dram face quite well. <laughs> no doubt I edited that piece. <laughs> Maybe it was one that, that uh, Scotty edited instead. But yes, I read all the content that goes through. Tyree Kai is one of my favourite writers. Um, yeah, I maybe need to look that up, Jimmy. Do you remember which article it was? Mark is saying, I've yet to pick up Salinity and Whiskey. Even old Pulteney or Talisker and Ross Brereton saying, I'm drinking the Lanois right now. Managed to pick it up at auction for almost RRP. Well done to you, Ross, and congratulations on that. Terrific, terrific stuff. Connell, we've covered all of the topics. There's only one more question left. I think you might have just answered that. Let's go with it anyway, just in case. I'll just put it up there before we roll into the quiz just because that's just done a, a full session tonight. Disaster strikes. All distilleries are forced to close. Only one can stay open. Which is it? One word answer should be easy. It cannot be Arda Merkin, my Obviously, friend. Obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you choosing between two? Mm-hmm. Is one of them clean leash and one of them Springbank? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go Springbank. I'll I'll vote for clean leash and then we can pour each other a dram. <laughs> what do you say about that? There you go. <laughs> Terrific. Terrific. There we go. Connell, I've, I, like I always do, just enjoy hanging out with you. I just like the laid back nature. I like your pragmatism. I like the, the fact that you're just down to earth and enjoy whiskey enjoy the space that you're in and that makes it easy for other people to enjoy the space that you're in too Desi Vleeland's in tonight good to see you Desi and Hillswood is saying eh, sorry Craig Elliki for her that's okay I think she gets a buy for Craig Elliki. I think that's worthy Do, are you on a curfew my friend or can you stay I appreciate we're keeping you that's this it's the witching hour and one minute from now it's we're hitting midnight can you stay for the quiz who me yes yeah, yeah, I've already I already committed for the quiz. Yeah, yeah, all good. I might need to go to the loo. You go to the loo, and I'll hang out with the lounge for a bit. Cool. And by the time you come back, I'll have the, the quiz spinning up and ready. All right. Fantastic stuff. I'm enjoying myself tonight, and I hope uh, it doesn't take away from you the fact how much I enjoy guest sessions. I, obviously, I enjoy some guest sessions more than others. Um, it, just depending on how much I know the person, how much I feel like I can relax, how much I feel like eh, they can take a bit of the, the load lifting as well. I've enjoyed so much of you being in throughout tonight as well. I hope you'll stay for the quiz. I will frame it by saying that last week was a very generous quiz. And it's because I think I was feeling like the weeks running up to last week was a bit tough and a bit challenging. It was 10 out of 10s were few and far between. But last week was like a, 10 out of 10 fest. So many people managed to break their duck and get their first 10 out of 10. And that was brilliant and a good way to start kicking off the festive season. Tonight, the pendulum might have swung back a wee bit far and there will be trickier questions tonight. But of course, there will be questions that you all know very, very well. 
Jimmy, you're celebrating being a member for the Barflies for 45 months, is saying, don't tell Connell, but I like him. It's good that you got that in while he was away for a comfort break, Jimmy. Terrific stuff. Ryan Sutherland is saying, ha, ah, <laughs> look, a break. I need to get my backside to Arna soon. Ryan, you do, buddy. And I actually need to get my backside away up north to where you are, my friend. That would be an amazing journey. It's been a while since I've been up there. Lock in on Sunday, says Daniel Williams. Eh, um, well, it's December now. I do need to work it out. I need to pick a Sunday that's going to work best. This Sunday, I need to check the calendar. By calendar, I obviously mean my wife and family. Um, eh, watch this space. Uh, for all my patrons, I'll let you guys know through Patreon exactly when the Sunday night lock-in is going to be. I'd like to get it a bit closer to Christmas if I can. It would be nice to have a kind of Christmassy lock-in and just kind of have that kind of behind the scenes hang out with you. Falsgraf is saying, these days, Klein Leash is more of a fond memory for me. It's feeling like that for a lot of us, isn't it, Klaus? But I have to say that that occasionally, and a wee bit like that one that's come along there, especially when it's from a bourbon cask, you know, there's a wee bit of light that's shone. And remember, Klein Leash has been making a hell of a lot of whiskey for a long time. There should be a lot of it out there for the future. How available it's going to be and at what price point, that's the question. Uh, oh my goodness, there's that really tough uh, Xovery, Xovery, Xovery. I don't know, my friend, I-X-O-V-R-Y. He said, Acrovite, have you got any of your single cast left? I'm enjoying a glass of both side by side here and can't help but think the lighter one is an X-White Wine Brook Laddie cask. I get exactly what you're talking about there. For me, that's like silver, searing, gorgeous, clean springtime. I just, I just love it, love it, love it so much. I would buy any of that for myself. There was one bottle appeared. Arthur Motley wanted to buy it for himself. He's obviously the guy at Royal Whiskies. It was the only bottle that was left. I couldn't believe that he didn't buy any for himself before that. He left it for everybody first. And I said, look, yes, I'll take it. But if you want, he said, I would like it. And he picked up the very, very last bottle, my friend. That was a wee while ago. So it's, I'm afraid it's long, long gone. Um, but there will be opportunities to do fantastic things in the future as well. And I'm so glad to hear you're enjoying it. Justin Ryan saying, I got to hop back to bed and I'll catch the rest on replay. Of course you have. You're in Hong Kong. It's the middle of the night, Justin. Go. Rest easy. And hello, Justin. <laughs> How's your Friday, my friend? Nice to welcome you back. <laughs> Anthony Lambert is saying, my first leave VPUB live in many weeks and you're planning a difficult quiz. Oh no, it might not be that difficult. Jimmy Legg is saying, I think it's pronounced nine ovaries. <laughs> ah, okay, I see where you're coming from there. Roman numerals for the IX, nine ovaries. <laughs> and Scotty Mac 4 is saying, really enjoyed tonight. Scotty Mac, a barfly, nice to have you in. If that's the first time I've welcomed you, yeah, it's good to have you here. Let's bring the man in, make sure he's washed his hands and he's ready. And he's got these uh, suit armour on to wade into the quiz at the end. I framed the quiz, Connell, to suggest that the pendulum swung back from very generous quiz last week to tonight being a wee bit more challenging. But you're a guest tonight. So the, the quiz will, of course, have some things. Eh, I just need to bring it in, actually, that are very much, um, let's say, indulgent of you. But not all the questions, just a couple of bonus ones. Tell me, did you watch any of the, the quiz last week? Sorry, I'm laughing at Gregor McQueen's comment. I think I think you need, I think you need to rescue me and tell me and tell everyone that I was actually in the waiting room for about five minutes before you let me let me back. <laughs> you were back very but but I, this that would be amazing if you know what a quick do you know what a quig is? No. No, uh, I'm assuming, quick, I, I assume is, I one of the original is. YouTubers is a guy in the Canada called Andy, a fabulous guy, one of the most laid back guys. It's a wee bit self indulgent, but sometimes I'll be sitting late at night and I'll pour a dram and I'll search Quig's channel just to see if he's drank this thing. His content is like nothing else that exists on YouTube, I'll be honest. But if he's sipping the whiskey that you're sipping, it's quite amazing. It's almost cathartic, therapeutic. I don't know. It's like some kind of reset to sip the dram that he's sipping and have him just on camera, just go into the dram. Uh, oh, I don't know what's going on with, I'm getting some notifications coming up here. But that's, anyway, one night, Food Quig just leaves his broadcast and goes to the toilet. 
and forever, for, ever since he did that, it's been called going for a quig. Yeah, and that yeah. was probably 2017, Gregor. So it shows you how long Gregor McQueen's been around Whiskey Tube. Well, there you go. I'll, uh, I, I may, I may take that up. In my yeah. Way. Um, I'm trying to get the quiz, pull the quiz in. This is a new thing. It's never happened before. I'm going to try one more time to bring it in. And if I can't bring it in here, I'll do a wee screen share where so we will get it up and running. Don't worry. Uh, it'll just need a wee bit of juggling. No, it's in this time. Now it's in. Here we go. The wheels are on and we're running. Good stuff. Connell, you know the gig. You've seen, you've, you know your way around a quiz at the end. You're a bit of an occasional bar fly yourself, right? Um, Some of the questions, look out for the banana skins. Uh, the asshat questions are really asshattery in its, in its full sense. Uh, it is deliberately awkward questions, but the pass mark is always five out of ten, my friend. And like I say, there's some bonus questions in there for you. Julian Rickman has bought us a dram to say, uh, much an entertaining V-pub with such an authentic guest, just like the whiskey from Arna Merkin. Top evening and got to get to the peninsula in 2024. Thank you. Julian, you need to get the, the up the peninsula. You're in the UK, my friend. It is a bit of a pilgrimage. You do feel a wee bit remote when you're there, but it's all the more enjoyable for it. Thank you for your dram, buddy. Cheers, Julian. Good luck with the quiz. Yeah, I need good luck as well, I think. Yeah, you will need. This is the nervous part, buddy. The work's been done okay. Now you can relax. But yes, there are, there are. Um, yeah. I, no, I'm not going to put any more pressure no, on No, no, please, you. just cr I, crack I on. wish you the very best. If I, if I fail, I will be the guy that fails. I'm <laughs> you can be the guy. I'll be fails. the guy. I don't think that's going to happen. Fails. <laughs> There's a couple of sticky ones in here tonight. I know that there are. Good luck, everyone. Pass mark is five out of ten. It's always multiple choice. Only share your score if you want to, and I'll try and catch as much of you in the lounge as I possibly can. Question one, Conor McKenzie, hold your answer in until I ask you, buddy. A Delphi selection feature a dancing man character in their branding. Who is he? You've just pointed out that he's actually started to feature on the bottle label. Who is the dancy man? Is he A, an ex-illicit distiller? B, an ex-prime minister? C, an ex-farmer and engineer? Who is the dancy man? Everyone is here. So good to see you. Chris, he's in a home alt, mates. So busy these days, Aquaviti. You guys are in my thoughts. The Arda Merkin, Arda America was amazing. I forgot about that. That was just a wee bit earlier in the year. You're over in the States promoting a, an exclusive bottle just for the Americans. What's the world coming to, Connell? I managed to get to try some. It was brilliant. Well, we just wanted to have a bit of fun. And, um, it, was, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was actually a really good project. I loved, I loved every part of it. And uh, yeah, we might, we, there might, it was so successful, there might have to be a, an Arden America part two. We'll see. And Arden America again. I have Man. to say, and I'll share this as a wee kind of guilty pleasure here, a wee guilty confession. I think your most handsome bottling is the Arden America bottling. It just had such impact and presence. I think it was a lot to do with the colour of the, the, the liquid inside and the label and things. I think the only thing that can beat it is potentially the ones that had the bar flies on there. <laughs> oh, you would say that. <laughs> hey, it's the only place I get to see it, right? Um, well, on that note, I never got my bottles in the post. Are they, are they on the way or have they been lost? I can't remember. <laughs> Listen, the only way you're going to get to try any of that liquid is to come down here. I'll make yeah, sure yeah. I keep some here for you, all right? So if you're passing the east end of Glasgow, swing by and there's some of that here for you. However, yeah. you and I got to deliberate over it at length to work we out did. which we was did. best. We did at least do that. We did at least yes, do that. Yes, we did. And I have to take my, I'll do, I'll say it live. The 411 took care of itself. 412 and 413 was debated and debated and debated because I was the only one in the room that wanted 412. And you, everybody else wanted 413. And when I brought them home and spent a week or two with them, I had to go back and say, you were all right. You were correct. Sometimes. You just have to give it a bit of time. Connell, the dancy man, who was he? That's Alex Bruce on Halloween. It's Alex Bruce at Halloween. No, it's, uh, it's of course, um, B. 
Sir William Gladstone, Indeed. the man who declared that, I think he did two things, that whiskey would be taxed on what was bottled after maturation and also uh, uh, blending and bond, I think. Would that he, be right? Well, I don't know if he did blending and bond, but I know he, he was the first person to pass the law of taxing alcohol or whiskey when it came out of the cask rather than being taxed when it went into the cask. Um, which he was also ch chancellor of the exchequer as well which encouraged people to leave it it was no longer a penalty to leave it maturing a wee bit longer to make it more mellow it was an inadvertent incidental quality control yeah. quite exactly amazing. i mean w w without without that law god knows what state the scotch whiskey industry would be in um if that didn't pass quite a big progressive fellow absolutely and, the, and and obviously the, the the cartoon that you see now is uh, is it was an old Punch magazine um, cartoon um, that was in a that was drawn and, and we've kind of adopted that as our mascot and and kind of a part of our Adelphi logo and have done for the last thirty years and it's progressively got a little bit more modern and uh, in fact fun fact the the same guy who actually drew the uh, Johnny Walker dancing man, uh, walking man, drew our dancing man. So, yeah. Wow, I hadn't made the connection. So there you go, for a future VPUB, that quiz question might appear. Nice wee tidbit, nice. There you go. One out of one for Connell, and so many of you guys in the, the, the lounge as well. Question two, Mortlack recently appointed designer Philippe Stark as their creative director. I think this is the third or fourth time that Mortlack is going to be rebranded and within the last decade. What apparently is Stark known for? This is based on the Diageo PR release. A, interior design, architecture, furniture, and vehicles. Or Stark is known for B, his use of bright colors and unusual shapes and materials. Or C, Stark is known for designs that should be affordable and suitable for mass production. Well, this is the pub. There's no room for tongue in cheek here. Oh well, I was going to say Iron Man, but that's Tony Stark. <laughs> Stark, it? brilliant. Yes, uh, did go through my head. <laughs> okay, I genuinely have got no idea here. I know that you're guessing. Just go okay. with your gut. Do you, me, do you want my gut now? Yes. A. He's known for interior design, architecture, furniture, and vehicles. Connell, you're spot on. You're absolutely right. Well, that's a complete and utter guess. Well, I can also tell you that he's also known for the use of bright colors and unusual shapes and materials. And he's also known, very interestingly, Whoa. for Mortlack like and Diageo, that he's also known, and this is in their PR, for designs that should be affordable and suitable for mass production. That's in the D Agio P R release. Bring on the 40 quid Mortlick, that's what I say. Bring it back, bring <laughs> it back, bring it back to me. <laughs> Aye, we want to hold our breath though, okay? So two out of two for Connell, two out of two for all of you in there. That's a freebie for everyone. Question three, Alex Bruce. Managing Director of Adelphi Distillery Co., mentioned a couple of times tonight by both of us, is a descendant of whom? A. Robert the Bruce, King of Scots. B. Sir William Gladstone, a progressive Prime Minister previously mentioned. Or C. Andrew Usher, often cited as the father of modern Scotch whisky. Alex Bruce, the Managing Director Connell's gaffer, basically, the managing director of Adelphi Distillery Co., is a descendant of Robert the Bruce, the King of Scots, Sir William Gladstone, progressive prime minister, Andrew Usher, the father of modern Scotch whisky. The lounge is absolutely lighting up, Connell, quite interesting. One glass man, Warner from Florida, good to see you, buddy. He's saying C by popularity, and Yuri is saying simply about whiskey. Sorry, Yuri simply about whiskey is also saying C. Seems too obvious. B has been a question. Let's go C, says Andrew Pierce. Connell, tell me about your gaffer. Well, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, this applies to 
two um, answers actually. So it's uh, C is correct. Um, and also A is correct. So Alex is the direct descendant of Robert the Bruce, um, which is something that I often say we should really lean heavily on from a marketing perspective, but we don't. Um, and I, actually, I'm quite glad that we don't. Um, but he is, he is um, their family are the direct descendants of, of Robert the Bruce. And from his mother's side, uh, Andrew Usher, uh, the, the father of uh, modern Scotch whiskey, you've already got that there. Um, Usher's vatted malt, etc., etc. from his mother's side. So I think that's his great, great, great grandfather, if I was going to guess. But yes, um, whiskey, whiskey is in the blood of, 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 of Alex and the family. Yeah, and you would Antonia. think, and Antonia, who, and Antonia, oh, and I, the gorgeous oh, Antonia, uh, she's works, amazing yeah. as well. Yeah. And I think both of them, if you consider both of those people, right, Lady Antonia, and uh, if you consider them, you would almost be a wee bit apprehensive or nervous about meeting them right up until the point that you met them, and their humility and their graciousness, generosity of time, and, and they're just, they're just, a, they're just a, a, a lovely family in general. Um, but uh, friends and to me, they're they're, they're friends and colleagues. Uh, right. And yeah, I, I I think if if you if you didn't know the the history, you you wouldn't you wouldn't know. You would just receive them as they are, and, and that's exactly what they are. They're just lovely people. Aye, thumbs up in his nineteen seventies TR seven. Just just amazing. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's either a big petrol guzzler or. A, on an electric car. On so an electric he, car. He has he, to he offset. Works. He's got he's got the balance right there. He has to offset one, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Question four. Uh, let's raise a wee glass to Alex. Actually, while we do that, Alex well, Antonio. I, I think I think he's watching. So cheers. Well, he's he's probably watching the icons as well. But uh, congratulations for everything that's happening tonight and everything that you've achieved so far. Cheers to y'all. Magic. Question four. Recently, the Scotch Whiskey Awards announced their distillery of the year for 2023. Who was it? This is within the last week, between the last VPUB and tonight, this was announced. Oh, Scotch Whiskey yeah. Awards announced yeah. a distillery of the year for 2023. Quite a surprise to a lot of folk. I was one of the ones that were surprised. Nonetheless delighted. I hope I'm not giving too much away. Was it A, a brand new 21st century island distillery? Was it B, a 20th century Speyside distillery, or C, a 19th century Lowland distillery. What I'm talking about here is the founding year, of course. So was it A, a distillery that's been founded in this century on the islands, or B, last century in Speyside, or C, the 19th century in the Lowlands? I, I, I do know this. Puts out our misery. I heard the tourism destination of the year winner is sound, says Ryan Sutherland. Oh, who won the tourism destination of the year, Connell? Eight doors. <laughs> I think it was. I think it, it genuinely it, it legitimately was. The eight doors, but I know that the, the, the question in question is A and it's lag. And it was Ryan Sutherland asking about the tourism destination. So it makes sense. It was, it was. Eight doors gone from memory now. Spot on. Absolutely right. Lag A is the right answer. A distillery that's just brand new out the wrapper. Fantastic to hear. Uh, I've been there myself. Uh, the very first sip of lag I ever had, I wasn't sure. I had to work it out very, very quickly. Um, really, really chuffed to have lag as part of the whiskey landscape. Just terrific. Very bold, very Mortlach-esque in a lot of ways. Those big, fat, dumpy stills are there for a very deliberate purpose. I am, um, if it's if any, I, I was um, speaking to Mariella um, from, yeah. Aaron, from, from, from Aaron and Lag in, in Milan and uh, was tasting through some new make and having a basic vertical of Lag and the, the distillate is just superb. Um, and they are going to be laughing. Well, I mean, Aaron's incredible anyway, but 
So there's no yep. surprise there. Um, but what 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 a distillate they've got in the, on their hands! It really is incredibly impressive. It's just so big, just big, 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 bold, amazing uh, new whiskey to have. Question five is always a picture question, Connell. I think you're shooting for four out of four tonight, my friend. Um, it's always a picture question. This is a picture from a bar fly and friend, Graham Fraser, tonight. We're clearly looking at a still house, a glazed still house. And of course, I'm just going to be straight asking you. I've got, I got, I've got a gut feeling what it is, but I, I don't, I'm not sure if I want to shoot before it's. Uh... Write it down. Have you got a bit of paper now? Uh, yeah, 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 I do. All right. um, Write it down. Can I tell you that this caught me out? And I wonder if it's going to catch Connell as well. Graham Fraser sent me through a bunch of pictures and one or, one or two of them caught me out this time. Yeah, it's, it's probably not what I'm thinking it is, but I've got I've got it here, yep. I think you and I might have made the same mistake. Let's go. Let's oh, see dear. if it, your answer comes up. Don't show it straight away. Okay. A, we're looking at Glendronach. B, we're looking at Craig Elliott, Or C, we're looking at Tomatin. Ah, shite. <laughs> it's not there. No, it's there, but I think it's the other one. <laughs> you and I, do you see the wee banana skin off to the, the left-hand side? Well, it depends on your perspective, of course. I, on the right-hand side as you're looking at it. I'm going to probably change my answer. That's what that's what I wrote. Can I show that? Yeah, show what you wrote. You wrote Craig Elliott. And I think it might be Glendronach. Biting my tongue, biting my tongue, biting my tongue. I'm going to jump in and look at the lounge. Lots of people, whiskey from the vestibule. B, uh, Yuri is saying Glendronach. Hell's Wid, Rob Smith, Pete Head, Yash Desai, all saying B, 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 B. Loads and loads and loads of people just straight out saying Craig Elliott. I can tell you, Conor McKenzie, we're looking at Glendronach. I changed, I did change. You did change, you did change. You had the same reaction as me. We looked at that and we saw Craig Elliott. The only thing that I think would make it obvious from the start is that black and white chimney. And off to the, the well, there are other differences as well. I think Craig Ellick is more, split it's into just, four it's, panes. It's more um, it shutters, I think. Yeah, there's they're split into more kind of four panes, and there's yeah, there's, the, there's a kind of uh, Dewar's thing, a legend you see across the, the Dewar's top sign, Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. so that is, yeah. a but it just when I saw it, I thought, well, that's Craig Ellick, and then no, yeah. it's Glenn Dronick. And I think it's a side of Glendronach that's off to the side because you don't normally don't see it. it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But you got it in the end. But unfortunately, I th what did, did you answer Glendronach in the end when you saw the options? You did. I did, yeah. I answered Glendronach. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I knew the minute I'd written Craig Elliott down, I knew it wasn't. As soon as you saw the options, you, sh you said exactly. Right, exactly. And you knew it. Five out of five, I have to give it to you. We weren't sitting here in real time. Chris Barlow managed it. Well done. Yeah, the chimney is a teller, that black and white chimney that looks a wee bit from certain angles, actually like a light, a skinny lighthouse. Anyway, question six. This is when it starts to get tough. Highland Park is the most northerly. Avangaric is the most westerly. And Bladnick is the most southerly. But which distillery is the most easterly? Oh, a, McDuff, B, Scapa, C, Lone Wolf. Brian Caballes, or Caballes, Caballes, has bought me a dram, Brian, good to see you, good day, I'll catch the replay tonight and crack a bottle of Arnhemark and Paul and why, you lucky bugger, he's saying cheers, guys, uh, nice of you to drop in, Brian, and buy us a wee dram uh, during the quiz, buddy, uh, nice to welcome you, I hope you've had a good time and enjoy picking up on the replay, my friend, good to have you, Brian. Pencil chewing time, Connell. Yeah, I mean, you're trying to picture the map of Scotland in your head, right? Yeah, it can't be Macduff, can it? Julian Rickman is saying, "Guess B." B B B B B B B G B B B B. I can't see. Oh, I. No, I can't see the chat. Can I? No, I can't. Um, okay, I'm going to go. Oh, I, 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 Lone Wolf is um, is thingy's distillery. Brew but, dog. Um, yeah, 
and their Aberdeenshire based or Ellen, yeah. yes. Yeah, my, my thoughts are um I can't think of I'm gonna go Scapa because it's it's an oddball. So I'll I'll, I'll go B. But only because I I, I don't I can't think of the geography of of Orkney now um, compared to the mainland, but that seems the most logical. It would seem there's Bananaskin missing from this one because it seems to have caught out a lot of people in the chat as well. Whiskey Total, Gino Camo, Whiskey with Molly, Molasses, Rick Johnson, Sugar Kitty, Whiskey from the Vestibule, Nikolai Nikolov, Jimmy Legg, and so many others went with Lone Wolf and got it right. Ooh. Oh, it's man. the obvious one. I can see you went, oh, Orkney up there, is it leaning over a wee bit? No, Scapa is not it. And Macduff, you quite correctly guessed, is not it. But it was Lone Wolf. Connell's first banana skin. It's a tricky one, buddy. It's a tricky uh -huh. one. Lots of the knowledgeable whiskey folk, including Willie Dolier, managed to bag that one safely. Good to see you, oh, Willie. Question seven, Ardemar can operate which kind of spirit condenser? Your job's on the line here for this one. <laughs> These are terms I'm making it up right enough. A, an external worm tub. B, an internal shell and tube. Or C, an external shell and tube. How does Ardemarkin condense its coastal spirit? Alex is saying, does Connell know if there is any Paul A at the distillery? Paul A? Is Paul Lenoir, I think he's saying. Paul There's Lenoir. no Paul Lenoir at the distillery, is there? There's no. 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 There's Paul Lenoir champagne. There's no Paul Lenoir whiskey. The market. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is a shoe-in for Conor McKenzie. Mikey Hayes saying C. Fernando saying B. Interestingly, absolutely nobody is saying A. Kyle Taylor is saying OC. And Kyle Taylor is saying outside. Connell, how do you distill your spirit? We have uh, an external shell and tube condensers, or a pair of. Absolutely. Hanging on the wall outside the building. Uh, fantastic stuff. Whiskey with Molly Bennett saying it's outside. Greg's Whiskey Gary saying, I don't know. So uh, go with C, part of the crowd. Absolutely, Greg. Always good to lean on the crowd. Unfortunately, Connell is going blind. He can't see the crowd, but he's currently shooting for six out of seven as we roll into question eight and ask, which single malt was in such high demand in the late 19th century that the distillery was obliged to refuse trade orders according to Harper's Weekly? So this is a contemporary periodical, Harper's Weekly, um, reported this at the time. This is back, way back in the day before single malt was even a thing. We're talking about a distillery that through fulfilling private domestic duty paid single malt fulfillment and specialist export only had to stop selling their malt to the trade. That's how much of the demand this whiskey was in in the late 19th century. Which malt am I talking about? A, McAllen, B, Glenlivet, or C, Klein Leash? And that's not a banana skin. <laughs> well, a banana skin is something that's deliberately got an answer in there to potentially draw you away from the right answer. Something that's deliberately a bit tricky. This is just a straight question. I appreciate it's hard. I picked this out from Charlie McLean's Wikipedia curiosity section, which I love. I mean, late 19th century. Oh, I could be a communicator. Generally, could be any of them. This was has historically always been one of the most prized malt whiskies by distillers, of course, but also highly prized by distillers and blenders, sorry. Um, but also highly prized, apparently, by private individuals and people in other countries who knew back then what malt whiskey was all about. Yeah. I mean, my, my, my guts be um, Glenlivet. Klein Leash, I think, is a bit too niche. And I, I just don't think McCallum was at that stage then. I don't think so. 
it makes sense that Glenn Levitt's the right answer, but God, it genuinely could be any of them. Road to Dram. Here's a name I'm shouting out a lot tonight. Whiskey from the Vestibule. Andrew Pierce. Whiskey with Molly. I'm looking for others. This has tripped up a lot of people tonight. Connell is Klein Leash. Ah. The one that you held up tonight in such high demand over 120 years ago, they stopped selling to trade. Incredible. Incredible. Back when malt whiskey was apparently not a thing. Mm. Thank you to Charlie McLean and his Wikipedia for that nugget. A belter it was too. Managed to take a wee bit of wind out of Connell's sales, but he's still doing well for six. Yeah, hours. thanks, Charlie. I appreciate that. Really good. <laughs> he's, he's not, he just shared the factoid. It was, unfortunately, uh, me uh, that I chose to pick it. I'd, I picked it for a very specific reason, as you can see. Question nine, second from last. It's not going to get any easier, I don't think. Which of these distilleries in Campbelltown was operational most recently? going to give you three names here and I want you to tell me which one has been operational most recently. Jenny Carlson has just rolled into the lounge asking what she missed. Congratulations Jenny. I hope you raised glasses high and celebrated well Hi. tonight. Robert. She's probably rolled in in more ways than one. I assume she's danced in the door. Well she deserves it. She deserves it. Okay, Connell, which of these distilleries in Campbelltown was operational most recently? A, Benmore Distillery. B, Scotia Distillery. C, Crosshill Distillery. <laughs> Falsgraf is one behind you, Connell, and he's saying he's happy there. So you should be. Should have gone with my own preferences, saying Sugar Kitty, Sugar Kitty, a very rare banana skin there for you, Sugar Kitty. Falling apart again, Fernando saying in five out of eight. Not at all, Fernando. You're comfortable. You've got a pass and there's still questions to come. Doing great. Kev, Keith McDonald's is saying hi, Jenny. That's still the same Keith McDonald in our pal in New Jersey. And he, Fernando's saying congrats to Jenny Carlson. What are we thinking here, big guy? What are we thinking, Connell? I am thinking randomly see only because it rings a bell of something I've heard about recently but I also think that the facility might be in Glasgow so I might be way off stick or move no I mean I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with C okay I can tell you that Ben Moore Distillery was a distillery that was operational in Campbelltown up until 1927, roughly about the same time as Glengyle Distillery closed. I can tell you that Scotia Distillery was operational in Campbelltown up until the 1930s. And Cross Hill Distillery, I invented. After Cross Hill Loch, the water source for most of the distilling in Campbelltown, Scotia Distillery was renamed by the Block Brothers, Glen Scotia. Oh, I'm feeling bad now, Connell. I'm feeling bad now. Scotia Distillery is still operational today. Yes, it has been shuttered in the past. It's been shuttered even very recently, but it's still very much going great guns and alive today. In fact, is one there, of the greatest is examples. Is there a Crosshall Distillery in Glasgow? Eh, not to my knowledge. Crosshall Lock. I, 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 think I'm getting, I think I'm getting confused. I think there is a Crosshall Distillery in Glasgow. Oh, there was. Think, and I think um, that's where I'm getting confused. Yeah, I just took the name of the water source for Campbelltown Distilleries, decided to pretend it was one of the 13 Campbelltown back in the day. Ben Moore, legitimate distillery, Scotia, the legitimate distillery renamed Glen Scotia. Obviously, it was easier to export, I think, and sell to the Western markets, the New World, if you had Glen in the name, so they changed their name back in the day. Yeah, okay. um, but Scotia Distillery became Glen Scotia. Yeah, okay. Okay, buddy, you have six out of nine, I believe. You're in comfortable shape. You've got a pass mark before you hit utter ass hattery at the end. Let's go into the lounge and see how they're doing. <laughs> uh, I knew it was going to be sticky and tricky for a lot of them. Six out of nine for Andrew Pierce and Alan Smith, same as you, Connell. 
along with the road to dram. Well, that's just Mike is saying, oh no, I'm doomed. He need, he's got four out of nine, he needs the ass hat. Five out of ten for Warner, one glass man. Gino Camo, six out of nine. Philip Wagner, seven. Good score, Philip, tonight. Let's see if anybody's going to be able to pip Philip. Peter Box is also on a seven. Sugar Kitty on a seven. Wow, seven. Kyle Taylor, Chris Barlow, seven. Whiskey Total, seven. Gene Kelly, seven. I don't think there's an eight in tonight. A brutal quiz. I take full responsibility. I thought it, Alistair McPhail swings in with an eight out of nine. Amazing. And Sugar Kitty is bracing us for the ass hat. I was looking for whiskey from the vestibule. He's seen no rats. He slipped up on that one as well. It looks like he slipped. Alistair McPhail could be our guy to try and take it over the line. The ass hat, Connell, you know what that's all about, my friend. Just me, as, as if I've not been difficult enough tonight, it's going to take it, get it even further. But here we go. Might have a chance with this. Pulteney was once the most northerly distillery in the Scottish mainland. But how many operational Scotch malt distilleries are located further north than Pulteney? Ryan Sutherland looking at you. Around the same number as A. The years of age stated on Glenallachie's new Mikkel Tor, the Turbo. Is it around the same number as B? The number of operational Isla distilleries pre Kilhoman? Or is it C? The number of official core releases from Inch Derny to date, as I speak to you on the 7th of December, 2023. Pulteney was once the most northerly distillery in the Scottish mainland. Fact. But how many operational Scotch malt distilleries are located further north than Pulteney? A, the same as the number of years of age stated on Michael Tor from Glenallachie, the Turbo. The same as B, operational Isla distilleries pre Kilhoman. Or C, the same as official releases from Inchderney to date, core releases from Inchderney. Well, here we go, says Rob Too Slow, as Hattery. Bruce is saying B. Well, Lassus is saying C, Jimmy Jazz is saying C, Kyle Taylor is saying A, Gabriel Welding is saying A, Willie Dolly are also saying A, and Nikolai oh. Nikolov is also saying A, Yuri also is saying A. Splitting the crowd as the asset often does. So you, to answer the asset, you need to know the answer to at least two different things. Mm -hmm. It's really horrible. How many distilleries, Connell, do you think are located north of Pulteney these days? Eight Doors, Wolfburn, Highland Park, Scaffa. So one, is there one in Shetland? There is eight reels. Is that a cut whiskey? I don't know. Oh, the Shetland reel releases? I don't think anything. Sorry. <laughs> Five. Then you've got Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, oh, what a nightmare question. Um, I'm going to go. I don't think it's. Is it Michael Thor? Michael Thor is five. Is it five years old? Did I just count five? <laughs> it tours will burn. Is there another one? There is. There's another one. It's called Deer Nest. It's five. Is that a distillery? It is a distillery. <laughs> How many operational Scottish ones? Right, I'm going to go A. A from Connell, locked in. He's agreeing with uh, the years stated on Michael Tor's The Turbo. Sounds on the like way, five. On the mainland, further north than Pulteney, does that count on off the mainland? Let me read it again nice and slowly to help. Pulteney, Pulteney was, was once mainland. the most northerly distillery in the Scottish mainland, full stop. But how many operational Scotch malt distilleries are located further north than Pulteney? Okay, so it could be, yeah, okay, fine. A, I'll stay with A. 
Congratulations, Mackenzie. Yes. Superb powers of deduction. Uh, even although you ended up in Shetland, I don't believe Durness or whatever you're suggesting there has actually managed to even uh, get any traction. They might be operating in secret. I happen to know of a distillery that's been op operating quite happily in secret recently. North Point Distillery, which has been making gin, um, has been also making Scotch malt whiskey recently and have just released, released Dal Claggy or uh, at least released the name and the news to the market. So we've got a brand new distillery up there, Dal Claggy, um, made at North Point Distillery. Uh, that goes alongside Wolfburn, as you quite rightly mentioned, Eight Doors Distillery, Scapa, and of course Highland Park, which means five. Operational distilleries pre Colhoman was obviously Bamore, Brook Laddie, Kalila, Bunahaven, Arbeg, Lafroig, and Lagavulin. So six, um, sorry, seven, that adds up to seven. And official releases from Inch Dearney, yes, they've had Fing Lassies and what is it, Strath Henry and Independent Bottler releases from Inch Dearney Spirit. But the only core release has been a single release, which is their Rye Law. Connell McKenzie, you managed to get through the ass hat at the end. Seven out of ten for Connell. A very, very decent score on a brutal, brutal quiz, Connell. Whiskey with Molly saying, tell, tell Connell, Cross Hill is a gin distillery in Glasgow and Trongate. Ah, there you go. And Gene Kelly is saying, seven out of ten, cross the finish line limping noticeably. It was a brutal quiz tonight. It was deliberate. If you don't mean the mainland, you're a true weasel. Says Jimmy Leg. <laughs> I do encourage people to read the question. <laughs> I made a statement and followed it by a question, Jimmy. I, I'm sorry if I threw a wee banana skin under your strides there. Connell's Scottish geography knowledge got rusty when he was in New Zealand. <laughs> I, I like that built-in excuse. <laughs> Connell came out of here with a seven out of ten, which I think is doing very well. Whiskey from the vestibule managed an eight. Alistair McPhail managed a nine. Same as Ben, Whiskey with Molly. Ben, Whiskey with Molly. And Alistair McPhail managed a 9 out of 10 on one of the most brutal quizzes, I think, in a long, long time. Amazing. Let's raise a wee glass to those two battlers. Uh, ben, Alistair, well done, well done. Connell, well done to you too, my friend. Well done. Oh, that's the... That's the, the Whiskey 101 I poured for Al earlier tonight as well. I think I'll finish off tonight thinking about Al too. Uh, just the flavour hit me there. Amazing. Connell, I very much, very much, as I, as I knew I would enjoy hanging out with you tonight. And I was mindful, given how much energy you've expended on the circuit recently, travelling all over the place and constantly talking about whiskey, whiskey, whiskey. You're just wanting some downtime now. You're just wanting to pull up with the family and relax a little bit. And here I am throwing you all these questions Not at all. and ass hats and all the rest of it. And yet you turn up with a smile, pragmatism and generosity and graciousness like you always do, like the rest of the team at Delphi, honestly. Thank you, buddy. It means a lot. I think it means a lot that you are willing to do so without any conditions whatsoever, like everyone that steps behind the bar. And I think, I hope, the real test is not being invited behind the bar at the V-Pub. It's being invited back again. Oh. I would like to have you back again, big guy. That was uh, great fun. No, absolute pleasure. And uh, yeah, I, obviously I know that everyone's familiar with uh, with Miss Carlson's face um, behind the V-Pub. But uh, yeah, it was, it was great to have a, a proper chat with you tonight and uh, just chat all things, not just Arden American or Adelphi, but just whiskey in general and our thoughts on where it is and where it's going. And uh yeah, we just just chuffed to be here and obviously see some see some familiar familiar faces that have that have popped up like Sandro and um Keith and, and, and people like that. Um it's, it's, uh, I get to meet these people uh in face to face scenarios, um, but I might not know them as their handles so it's uh it's been great it's been really really great and uh it's uh it's a, been a pleasure to be on it really has you've been. truly impressed me i know there are a lot of people in the lounge tonight as well that you actually know and remember them uh, from when you have met them face to face it's not an easy thing to do connell i take my hand yeah off. but i think you know like it's all very well talking about the liquid the whiskey and all the rest of it but you know whether you're a consumer and 
an enthusiast if you're in the industry whatever whatever you are in in, in this big whiskey sphere it's just it's about the people and it's, it's the people that make it and uh that's 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 the I, I i will end on a cheesy line i will end on a cheesy line and that is my cheesy line is that it is it's you you say whiskey folk and uh, i couldn't agree more it's it's the people everything everything revolves back to to the people behind it drinking it enjoying it talking about it evangelizing about it um it's all about it's all about the human touch and uh yeah i think that's the most important part connell if somebody criticizes you for ending on a cheesy line ask them to offer you an alternative that can yeah. say the same sentiment without being cheesy and if they offer you one you can accept the criticism but until then here's to a cheesy ending my friend slancha cheers to you merry christmas happy new year Merry Christmas, Conor McKenzie. Listen, if you can stay post-credits, I would love to raise a drum with you before we roll into our camps tonight. Uh, but otherwise, you're free to leave. Thank you for... Yeah, no, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely do that. But I needed I needed to just do that last wee sentence just to get over the three-hour mark. So, uh, yeah. Oh, well done. Well done. <laughs> nice for milking it. Nice for milking it. Thank there you, you so much. It, we're in December now. We don't care about the times anymore. Yeah, yeah we I'm have just, joking, just speaking. Joking. Cheers, Connell, a pleasure, my friend. I'll see you in a second. Thank you. Cheers. Listen, I hope everyone enjoyed that. I'm sure you did. A very, very, very good spirit. Wonderful guy to hang around with. Generally, like the majority of the guests that honestly we've ever had on the VPUB. It's a wonderful position to be in. Hell's Word is saying, Fab VPUB, grand guest and Connell McKenzie Aquaviti. Thank you, Helen. Gino is saying, thanks for another great VPUB with a gem of a guest. Thanks, Connell. Oh, and it jumps. It jumps. I need to wind back up and now find. Come on, come on, come on. Pete Head is saying, and with that, I call it a day. Thanks as always for organising Aquaviti. Thanks to Connell. It'll be a great guest. And all of you, see you next time. Slanchova. Thank you, Frank. Please enjoy your rest tonight over in the Netherlands, buddy. Good night. Uh, Jimmy Legg is saying, and a close... <laughs> as close to a weasel as I could get. So he's putting in my, nice emojis because uh, I've managed to get to Jimmy tonight. Fantastic, Jimmy. Thank you so much. Yuri's saying, thank you, Roy, for another great VPUB and thanks to Connell and Cher. Uh, internal things. Good night, everyone. Falsgraf is saying, very nice VPUB. Thanks to Roy and Connell. Good night. Jenny Carlson is throwing in love hearts as well. Jenny, congratulations to you once more. Good to have you in. Daisy Vleeland is saying, good night, Roy, Connell and the Barflies. Thoroughly enjoyed tonight and I'll see you next week. Gene Kelly saying, never a question that VPUB guests will entertain and inform. Bravo. Thank you so much, Gene Kelly. Wonderful to welcome you in. And it's also nice to work out that you're a New Yorker too, or at least by state, if not by city. Philip Wagner is saying, thank you so much both of you for this amazing VPUB. And a big shout out to Conor McKenzie for one of the most fun, generous and hospitable guys in whiskey, says Philip Wagner. Thank you, Philip. Rick Johnson saying, a pleasurable and energetic evening, Roy. It was great listening to Connell share his story. Thanks again for another memorable, informative and fun VPUB. Thank you, Rick. Thank you so much and Graham in Canada saying wow three hours of time beautifully well wasted <laughs> thank you so much cheers Roy please come here weekly to waste your time please Graham wonderful to have you in big guy I hope you and Gina are doing well uh, and Claudette and of course Catherine and everyone Alan Smith is saying great stuff Roy have a, have a good weekend all the same to you as well Alan have a brilliant weekend my friend and Gary Kilted Drama up in Inverness is saying cheers folks cheers Conor McKenzie I'll see you further than that 1953 dram tomorrow morning <laughs> he's going to turn up at Connell's house uh, listen I hope I caught everybody tonight I hope I caught everyone listen I started out tonight with a wee kind of sad note and I want to end on thinking about that same personality in whiskey who's no longer here with us his content is there for us to pick up and at our whim for as long as it lasts but i think more than anything we all need to raise a glass for all of these people that touch our lives that come in and make this community so full of life and energy and love i'll raise this glass this last final sip of wild turkey 101 to big al to the beautiful big al and to every single one of you and remind you all you're very dearly loved and valued and until next week thank you all slanchevar